to announce the first, third and the last day of soil assembly. We had two exciting days of panelists Recording in progress. inside this amazing architecture of Samira Rotot at the Copper Yard. Two exciting days with performances, workshops, talks on theories and active projects that are inside and living the theories and the ideals of, of how we increase our soil ecologies and also a lot of networking for multilateral coalitions. For this last day of the soil assembly, I will introduce today um, the two panels which are on food transportations as well as on living communities. And this last day of panelists will be also the ending for us of an online streaming and presentation but the panels, they will stay archived on the site as well. So every day you can go back and have a look and repeat and see what all has been given as content. Today's panels, the two of them, the first has the topic of food transportation, climate change and ocean trades. Amongst the panelists, there is the independent curator, Rob Lafranet, who will talk and introduce his project on future of transportation. There is Sumesh Kumar, an artist and farmer from Bangalore city, and also Gabriel G, who is owner of the Teti Press and will introduce his publication on the Maritime poet Poetry. Time's Up is an international, international artist group consisting since 1996, based in Linz, Austria, but from around the world. For the second panel, there will be uh, the title Living Projects and Living Communities, which dives a bit more in projects that are currently active. So from journalism, exhibiting, hackers and artists, there is Osta Chawan from Bangalore, a Bangalore-based artist, lecturer and researcher. And then a growing culture, which I'm really proud to introduce here, a very outstanding journalism that has a strong voice on food sovereignty and gives voice to the farmers. There is Margot Schwab from Food Culture Day, a biennale, but also a platform for knowledge sharing and know-how on ecology and food within the artistic practices, but also transdisciplinary practices. As well as at the end, Marc Dussier from Hecteria Network, who will introduce the project of Rocha, which has been a two years ongoing research on how to measure and make visible soil ecology. So for now, I will introduce Ewan Chardonnay, who will moderate and guide the first panel. Hello, everybody. So, can we can have, yeah, the slides. I will, so I'm really um, delighted to moderate this discussion. It's um, also a question that I'm, I'm really particularly interested in, this question of food and transportation. Um, I will give, a, a, let's say, introduction to this, uh, panel. Um, I will try to make it not too long, but I prepared you some slides to um, give a context of um, of the, the impact of food transportation and climate change.
Uh oh, yeah. So, so when we talk about climate change and global warming, it's no doubt connected to the story of uh, globalization. One could even argue that at certain point in the history of globalization, now known as a great acceleration, you can see on the graphics since the 1950s onward, everything has been going somehow exponential. And it's overwhelmingly contributed to the forging of this connection. So much of so that some scholars have been the beginning of the Anthropocene, the so-called era of the impact of humankind on the planet, down to this period itself, starting with could say also with the atomic bomb in 1945. Uh, UN studies tells that the food systems contribute around 21 to 37 percent of the global anthro anthropogenic causes of greenhouse gas emissions for the period 2007-2016. Food needs to be grown and processed, transported, distributed, prepared, consumed, and sometimes disposed of. Each of these steps creates greenhouse gases that trap the sun's heat and contribute to climate change. I insist a bit here because a third of all human-caused greenhouse gases emission is linked to food. The largest chunk of food-related greenhouse gases come from agriculture and land use. This includes, for instance, methane from cattle's digestive process, nitrous oxide from fertilizers used for crop production, carbon dioxide from cutting down forests for the expansion of farmland, or the agricultural emissions from manure management, rice cultivation, burning up crop residues, and of course the use of fuel on farms. Other share of the greenhouse gas emissions of food are caused by whether refrigeration and transport of food, industrial processes such as the production of paper and aluminum or packaging, and the management of food waste. Animal-based foods, especially red meat, dairy, on farm streams, are generally associated with the highest greenhouse gas emissions. This is because meat production often requires extensive grasslands, which is often created by cutting down trees, releasing carbon dioxide stored in forest. Cows and sheep emit methane as a digest grass and plants. The cattle's waste and pastures and chemical fertilizer used on crops for cattle feed emit nitrous oxide among powerful greenhouse gases. Shrimp farms, we are on seaside here, right? Shrimp farms often occupy coastal lands formerly covered by in mangrove, forests which absorb huge amounts of carbon. The large carbon footprint of the shrimp on ponds is mainly due to the stored carbon that is released into the atmosphere when mangroves are cut down to create shrimp farms. Then plant-based foods, such as fruit and vegetables, whole grains, beans, peas, nuts, and lentils, generally use less energy, land, and water, and have lower greenhouse gas intensities than animal-based foods. But a recent study published in Nature in July 22 shows that food miles, the distance between the place where food is grown to your plate, has a much higher carbon footprint than previously estimated. The carbon cost is actually around 19% of all food-related transportation emissions. Just transportation of food is responsible for about 6% of the world greenhouse gas emissions. Scientists will carry on uh, carried out the, the research, analyzed 74 countries and region and seven, 37 different types of food. You can see here that food production, of course, meats emit a lot in food, but also transport of vegetables and fruits are also highly emitting. While China and the United States or India and Russia are the top food transport emitters, Overall, high-income countries are disproportionate contributors. Countries such as the United States, Germany, France, and Japan constitute 12.5% of the world population, but yet generate nearly half of food transport emissions. Transportation associated with fruit and vegetables add up to around 36% of the total food em miles emissions, nearly du doubling the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from the production. You can again see this on the, on the graph. Meat production, on the other hand, emits around 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, but transportation costs a little over 100 million tons. 
The high emission for fruit and vegetables is largely, largely due to carbon intensive refrigeration to keep produce looking as rip and plump as possible. The studies say we tend to interpret information around us in simplistic terms, like meat is bad and vegetables are good. Fruit and vegetables are the highest food mine emission because they often need it to be refrigerated and consumed. And consumers demand a lot of out of season foods. So what to do? Well, if we want to sum up and according to the United Nations, where appropriate shifting food system toward plant rich diets, which more plant protein, reduced amount of animal based food and less saturated fats, such as dairy based products, coconut oil, palm oil, can lead to a significant reduce in greenhouse gas emission compared to current dietary patterns in most countries and mostly industrial countries. Reducing food waste is also key. Almost 1 billion tons of food, 70% of all food available to consumers worldwide goes into trash bins every year. Loss of food in transportation is enormous. If food waste were in country, it would be the third largest emitting country in the world. Around 30% of fruits and vegetables is wasted due to lack of proper storage and handling, delays during the transportation and distribution stages. Food waste and losses are mostly due to breakdown in the cold chain, producing product handling during transportation, climate conditions, or poor production planning of the utilization of raw materials. Calibration culture also has an impact. Even if the so-called imperfect food, like bad looking fruit or veg, can actually be used in the same exact manner as perfect food, so-called, and taste the same on scooped. Rich countries can reduce their food transport emissions through various other mechanisms. This includes investing in cleaner energy sources of, for vehicles, in, incentivizing food businesses to use less emission intensive production and distribution methods. Implementing zero low carbon transportation systems in last mile can also be a key element to reduce production pollution by carbon emission in cities. Other interesting option is a fair transport movement whose goal is to minimize the CO2 footprint by raising awareness of sustainable transportation and show that food feed on freight can be transported in an environmentally friendly and sustainable manner. So in this panel, we also want to reflect on the transportation of food and feed via sailing. It carries a lot of meaning here yeah, in the port of Museris and Kochi, the ports were born long before petrol age. Another model we can discuss is also the Fab City model, so-called, that proposes a new urban economic and social industrial model that relocalizes production to the city and to bio-regional context. Here another graph from the Fab City. The largest chunk of um, sorry. The, um, I wanted to introduce you the, the permacircularity model, which is a, a composite between permaculture and circular economy. Um, the term coined in 2016 by uh, Christian Hansberger and Dominic Bourg. And we have been talking a lot about this question and during the preparation of this event. Um, not only because, uh, let's say, um, it wants this movement want to point out that there's, uh, let's say, the circular economy, so called, is uh, also being appropriated and could be used in some, uh, let's say, gated societies of the so-called new green capitalism. You can see uh, a bit of this, whether you have a holistic view, but you can also consider this can be used as a segmented view and you see this fortress circular economy. So that's uh, so something we should keep in mind. But I want just to now 
go to our panelists. And regarding transportation impact, the study in nature that I was talking about has one main advice, eat local and seasonal. And yesterday we were talking at dinner, I remember about uh, leeches or kiwis in Europe tables. Sometimes we get leeches from China or kiwis from New Zealand. It's a question we really should ask ourselves. And so this really this to demand unseasonal foods year on and would you need to be transported from rest where it's really a, a question. So if the whole population of the planet would eat locally, emission will drop by around a third of a gigaton. For foods that must be transported, shifting to cleaner vehicles could also help to lessen the blow. So through the nature study, I acknowledge this scenario it cannot always be realistically applied. It, to say maybe because many regions cannot be self-sufficient in food supply, it could be still implemented in various degrees. For example, there is a considerable potential for peri-urban agriculture to nourish uh, urban residents. The so-called low-cover culture should be, in that sense, promoted. Local food that is produced within the short distance of where it is consumed, often accompanied by a social structure and supply chain different from the large-scale supermarket system. Eating local seasonal alternatives, yeah, maybe French season, map and Indian one could really provide a, maybe a, a healthier future in that sense. So I would like to, to ask Suresh Kumar to join us on the floor. Suresh is a Bangalore-based visual artist who in recent years has worked within, with performance and community-based art practices. So his work throughout this artistic career deconstructs the narrative topic of both India's first modernity and the second, revealing the fissures and discontinuities between the promises and reality, city and village, agriculture and industry, old and the new working in the harmony to build a new India. The Sarjapura Curie is his homegrown project of Suresh Kumar. It has been his dream project since he was a little boy. He's going to tell us a little bit more about his vision regarding this. And I give you the floor, Suresh. Thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you for introducing and uh, setting up this whole uh, setup. And uh, uh, thanks, uh, Swisti, Meena, and all the team, and my previous colleagues and at uh, Future of Transport. Somehow I'm in a weirdest uh, panel with all the statistics <laughs> showed. Uh, I'll be more sharing on the softer side of all this, uh, more uh, story. And uh, but uh, I'll be not presenting what Sajja Prakaris is doing, but I'll be more talking about uh, what constitutes uh, what I'm practicing right now at this project alone. And uh, it's a time bound project, but uh, most like un like my most of my previous projects, this unfortunately has not come with a deadline yet. <laughs> so I wish to uh, sum up uh, this project soon. And but in the process, I have all these questions which I'm going to raise today uh, in, in concerning with the uh, stress that we have on ourselves and also on our ecology and also on our system around, you know, but because we have some, we are, we are particular what you want to eat for the very that desire, you know. So I'll just play a small video for because <coughs> a lot of people uh, don't know Sajja Prakari's things like that, or or they know means uh, they might have not seen how the actual farm looks like uh, right now. This is an old video. Uh, we'll just play. It's a very journalistic video. I didn't make video. I have not got time to make a video about my farm yet. So whatever is there online is all the very romantic, romanticized, uh, heroic kind of a videos. So I apologize for that. So Benjamin, please play the video and then I'll talk.
the Winter Palace is now in the second edition. The last year it was uh, more on a natural scale uh, to engage uh, women gardeners in the suburbs of uh, the urban families around to look back or revisit kitchen gardens and things like Let's say this is my art project, not an art project access to it. I'm not quick art to do this. This is my practice. So it's a very strong uh, connection. It's very personal also that single parent and then having a daughter. And uh, also she had to help and things like that. So that, that kind of uh, made you feel very about the food we are consuming, uh, for example. And many farmers around the world make sure there's tables and this village, we were selling, uh, it was just beside Kajokra, with the village, it's the highest number of vegetables in this entire town. And you try to build a plant and plant it in all the conditions. So, why definitely not a place like No. So, then the plants are also really coming out of the society and all the things. So, we can't make an ideal a plot or a farm to grow everything else. So, based on the region, what is finding there, what is native to that, is what activity of the people. So my logic of now is, if I'm not able to make a good seed in my climate condition, I should be more And unfortunately, the urban gardeners, the ones other who have many varieties of seeds, I don't think that I actually farmers are. You know, farmers have no patience with table seeds, don't see them. In case in the kind of situation we are around the city. Today, we ended up with two varieties of beets. We ended up with uh, maybe one or two varieties of chilies. But the, what happened to the, all the seeds which were there? Well, for me, food matters first. Food is about probably the community. Food brings people together. A lot of people have replicated our, our what we are doing. That's the whole idea. Sorry, I'm using my daughter's uh, iPad. I need password from her all the time. <laughs> ah, that image. Yes. Okay. So that's the web page of uh, Sarja Prakaris. Uh, still not uh, totally active, but uh, that speaks a lot. Uh, Yes, yes, that image. Yes. 
So that's the homepage of our website, which says you see uh, as the COVID eased over the time, and uh, a lot of students, a lot of children, a lot of families started visiting the farm. For many families and many students or kids, uh, that their first outing was our farm. Because then some of the, the newborn kid for three months has not seen the sky also because they stayed in an apartment nearby. So they didn't know where to take their baby first out, you know. So this farm had become something like that for a lot of people like that. You know, it's not about what we grow and what we're selling and all that. But this farm was something like for them post-COVID and in the troubled times that they could relate to this. And uh, so now uh, we have a uh, uh, like uh, line of events uh, happening with children and things like that. So I ended up Though I isolated myself from teaching and just uh, uh, and went to uh, went to this kind of a mode in the farm, but uh, students are coming, children started coming, so I ended up as a teacher, and now I'm back at uh, with the colleagues here again. <laughs> so thank you. And okay, now coming back to the actual talk today uh, about food and transportation. Uh, what makes us to this old statistics we have said about uh, to burden ourselves around and things like that? First is like something like nostalgia. We are nostalgic to certain food. And then uh, we have longing for certain food, and then we have uh, or the sense of belonging. Like a lot of people, I've seen migrating from India to other countries, and they want to have a curry patta plant in Canada or US. You know, curry patta is a curry leaf plant, <laughs> or vice versa. And uh, something when they see a plant, uh, uh, like a holy plant, like a basil or something, they relate to their homes back in India, something like that. Or it is the just mere body cravings, you know, and. Uh, uh, then this is this happened to us vice versa also when we were colonized we a lot of uh, portuguese and british a lot of people bought a lot of things to us especially bangaloreans because we Bang they realized that bangalore is a very moderate temperature we are between the high uh, hill station at uh, uti and then the chennai presidency in chennai so they couldn't grow much in chennai and they had uh, ideal conditions in uti so they tried to tropicalize a lot of plants that even apples were grown in lal uh, sorry in lalbag in bangalore so things like that. And the uh, grapes is grown two times in a year in Bangalore. So this was an ideal condition. And that's how it gets a tag called Garden City. And also Bangalore is also a man-made city. Both greens. The green at the, in Bangalore is man-made. We don't have rivers as such. And we don't have a uh, lake. Um, of course, sea is not that too far. And we are on the very, very higher altitude. So all people did was as they inhabited the city, uh, the city grow, they kind of harvested the uh, water then and there and build a lot of uh, tanks. They, basically, they're not lakes, but they're tanks. And they saved water and they made the uh, uh, greens. Uh, I mean, so the, the forests around and the trees around and things like that. So all they did is the, they planted trees on the roadsides so that they can commute in the shade because there's nothing around. You know, there's no forest to cut and walk into the jungle or something like that. So this is the setup. And then what, what constitutes other thing is the migrants. I've seen a lot of migrants moving to other cultures and they're missing some food. For example, if a Nepal family most of goes to the Gulf, they might be missing certain plants. So they'll try to grow mustard, mustard greens or something like that in Dubai, like condition there, you know, as a, as a, whatever seeds they could take. And some countries, the airports or the immigration is very strict about the seeds so that you don't take uh, and uh, um, make mess with that. But we have had, we have enough mess around here with the migrant species around, you know. And then as we get nostalgia, for example, uh, there's a story that how uh, we at Karnataka in Chikmangalore estates, we ended up uh, growing coffee so much and we we're exporting uh, very pristine, good quality coffee to the uh, rest of the world. Uh, and that best coffee, you still don't get it in Bangalore, you know. So the coffee, the story is that uh, one of the saint or uh, whatever holy person had, had been to Gulf uh, to get to, to the Mecca, things like that. And he, he st steals few seeds of coffee. Uh, it steals because it was like very monopolized and things like that. The so seeds are bought to Chikmangalore and tried there, and we are on, one of the largest coffee producers today in India. And what happens to that story is we know that how the coffee estates bloomed and how the native crops kind of uh, all gone there. You know, so the plantation ideas. Um, so the, the nativity goes and then uh, we are busy uh, making money and uh, making things and we forget that we should grow our own food also there. And courtesy, the, uh, the green revolutions and the food revolution, the milk revolutions, and the, all that made us to build a lot of dams. And what dams are doing, not only for the ecology, to our own food system. We have surplus rice or surplus wheat or surplus sugarcane and we, we are telling people to eat rice now. So like my father, maybe 60 years back, didn't eat rice at all, despite being in Bangalore. 
because rice was a very precious thing. The rice was used only during the Deepavali, is a festival of lights that to make a kajaya or sweet. That's all. So today, the government supplies us uh, 20 kilos free rice every month to your door. I'm talking about the, uh, just this, this whole thing of how it has changed in 50 years, that what we are eating and what we are forced to eat or what we are, uh, uh, no options to eat else, anything else, and through the food distribution system. And same story with potatoes. We South Indians were never liking potatoes because it doesn't suit us because we don't have extreme cold conditions in South India, more or less in Bangalore, especially. And we don't sweat in Bangalore. And we today we're eating potatoes almost on a daily basis. So what, what native or uh, my ancestors said is to avoid potatoes so that you don't get, you don't get uh, like joint pains and arthritis and things like that. So potato was like the least consumed vegetable around. And uh, this whole uh, thing about hybridization, because we wanted to have a uh, feed a lot of people and then uh, hybridization came in. So the hybridization not only produced a lot of food, but actually it, it lost a lot of nutrition also. Forget about organic and non-organic chemical and all that. Just because hybrid also has also made some kind of a uniformity to the crops, minimize the crops, like you would have like 20 varieties or 30 varieties of bottle guards. Now it's boiled down to only two shapes. I'm not talking about the varieties, I'm talking about the sh two shapes of bottle guards and one size of snake guard. So I, the size is very important here because as the families are uh, uh, becoming um, uh, kind of a nuclear families, you have only couples or you have one child. So you can't buy a bottle guard of this size and take it home. And we mostly developed post COVID, we developed the phobia for the cut fruits or cut vegetables. So the, what the hybrid companies were making the seeds for uh, this vegetables, they've developed a, a snake guard, which was supposed to be snake guard as thus long has come up to this size. Now one, one, one family can buy own small snake guard and to consume that's enough. And ash guard is so big, we, still now they've not developed any small ash guard yet. These are the fears that as a, as a farmer, as a vendor, I deliver vegetables every day. I deliver milk every day. So how this is also affecting a uh, real time, because I'm talking about the real experiences, what I'm facing as a farmer, as a vendor, as a consumer. So this hybridization, not only promised our thing, but also it re restricted a lot of growth. So as I said in the video that none of the farmers have any native seeds anymore. It's the only passionate urban gardeners uh, or the real remote tribes somewhere consciously working in interiors are the ones who have say, seeds. Actual farmers, commercial farmers don't have seeds with them. And same with the milk transportation. When, there were, when our native cows were giving one liter, depending on their mood, and depending on what the choices, depending whether you like that day, the person or not, our cow, our cow does that. She is very moody. She, and, and she gives milk only to one lady. That's all. If anybody else tries, no, she is not. She is not. So our milk consumption was based on emotions of the animal. And uh, our eggs, our hen, when they decided that I lay only eggs for 15 days and next 15 days I'm busy hatching my kids or whatever it is. So, but today, no, you have a uh, varieties like which can give 365 days eggs without a, without a male cock mating it. Forget about sun and light and food and things like that. Okay. So we have eggs every day. We have milk eggs and we also ended up with excess production of milk. So we don't know what to do milk. Then the advertisers started coming saying that drink milk every day, stay healthy, even for adults. It's not only that children have to drink milk. Adults are forced to drink milk with the advertisers. And, and then people started uh, saying no to milk. And then they said, okay, you don't milk. We'll set the, we'll set the same milk powder into curd, set curds. You're not liking milk, you're forced to and uh, are influenced to eat set curd, set dahi, you know, what you're very fancy. And, and, and how the ice cream companies are increasing because you have more uh, milk powder left. There's a story which I heard about the uh, US in the 60s and it's happening in India right now. And then same with the story with the oils. So my grandmother is to challenge her uh, daughter-in-laws. It's a joint family. So including my mother. So she would join, uh, challenge a new come home daughter-in-law saying that anybody who uses green chilies and anybody who uses a tarka, tarka is uh, seasoning with oil. At uh, end of the dish, you season the curry or uh, or uh, greens or uh, sorry, the sabzi or something like that. So any any lady, I mean, derogatorily, any lady who uses green, uh, green chilies in the, in, the, uh, in the recipe and the uh, oil, tarka, can make any dish. And that's what Dabas are doing for us. All street side food is not without any green chilies at all. Okay. So green chilies, first, first of all, chilies is not ours. We only use peppers. We never had chilies actually. And forget about green chilies, fresh green chilies. So 
if at all traditionally in india where we were using is the ripe chilies dried chilies which is much safer to our whatever system and things like that and the oils i'm saying so we have excess oil as a ch as a child i was growing up i never saw somebody frying kebabs i mean chicken in oil i never at the most was a sweet dish but today we are seeing from every street food every fancy uh, food on instagram say post covid is all about frying some are deep fried some are double fried some are triple fried and the uh, sad story of the millets the we built dams and we ended up uh, uh, growing excess rice and we don't know what to do with that rice now so we ended up giving for free to the all the villagers 20 kg 20 20 kg is free this happened even in the with the populist governments like nt ramarao in andhra pradesh who started first one to give uh, uh, under the food security or whatever populist projects it's eating millets and other things jowar and things like that or, or which actually if you make a roti you can never eat roti with rasam can somebody eat uh, roti with rasam but you, you you can eat rice with rasam so that happened there when you're forced to give them i mean if, uh, rice for 2 kilos they they stop growing millets and things like that or stop eating because they have first of all the working class doesn't have time they have to rush back to the work and so what they did is they ended up uh, eating rice with rasam and going on moving on so when they were making when they were eating rotis they had other options to eat either greens or either kalu or something to eat with the roti so how it or some kind of a chutneys and gojus and things like that so that made them to stick on to this my daughter loves anarasam so much it's easy so it's very difficult to achieve a roti with uh, vegetables and things like that and uh, dams dams actually dam gave us all white things sugarcane maida and of course palm oils from elsewhere and then not only talking about this about the fabric we are wearing and i have really experienced a bio cotton in a wear how long it can last a lot of people who might have tried lucky lucky ones are in the europe who can still buy a bio cotton fabrics i mean i'm not talking about cotton alone i'm talking about the native cotton uh fabric used in your uh, in, in making of it organically grown and native seeds the cloth will never give up i tried it but whereas even the cotton what we buy in from the fancy fa fabric and things like that it can give up because it's not a uh, native seed and it's not organically grown we are satisfied if it's just hand loom made that's enough or natural dye used we are satisfied it's like satisfying when you see a shop initially in 90s naturally sorry not not naturally grown fresh vegetables available here we were happy with that in 90s if a board says fresh oh it's coming freshly without transportation or something like that. but then we realize no fresh is not enough it has to be chemical free then we are okay chemical free oh okay. yeah then organic sir 99% of our, our all our organic produce is still hybrid only not uh, heirloom varieties or desi varieties and we know the difference we are only satisfied now with the chemical free food that's all but not gone to the what's happening to our body by uh, or uh, what constitutes and what is the taste what is this memory what is this nostalgia of a difference between a, a, a native uh, snake guard fragrance and the hybrid uh, safer food uh, uh, snake guard and also we're talking about alien plants and uh, invasive and things like that and how much allergies we are getting to so people have developed because of this kind of uh, milk practices we are having that's why people have developed this allergies towards milk also milk which was supposed to be one of the safest thing and we are adulterated it so much in the sense not adulterated it's processed it so much that our children got developing allergies towards it and now we have to fancy ourselves and call we are into veganism and things like that very unfortunate and when we are talking about the oils uh, the milk when we talk about the transportation my uh, uh, great grandmother uh would only take a ghee on the on her on her head top and walked from uh, sarjapura to cantonment to sell her ghee to the british uh, colonies there so she would not take milk at all because it, she would really walk for 3 hours so what was being transported at the time was the only ghee possible and ghee is still safe but not the butter or the uh, fresh milk 
so allergy is talking about the allergies why we are talking about native species and it's not that in the national extent as i said it is about the, the allergies we develop because of their alien because how the bangalore saw a lot of uh, trees uh, which from bought from uh, different continents to experiment and to try and to beautify our city and how a lot of people uh, developed allergies towards breathing them like pathenium for example it when it flowers is the is most dangerous and a lot of people can't even touch them but it's it's everywhere you know things like or lantana in the forest and uh, yeah i talked about the animal and the chicken so these are the uh, all the uh, topics which i'm uh, address now is something more or less is guiding my practice at saja prakaris uh, we try to develop fresh milk uh, in a very symbolic way every day milk is taken to most of the communities around and also we try to encourage women uh, to graze their cattle poor i mean poor families who doesn't have land but there are a lot of uh, because it's a uh, uh, sajapra is surrounded with a huge institutional spaces and real estate and things like that so there are a lot of empty lands still marked and bought from the farmers but they've not built yet they're waiting for the prices to go up and things like that so these empty spaces gives boon to the cattle uh, grazing and sheep and the goat grazing so this gives a lot of pos possibilities for the uh, smaller uh, uh, agrarian lives who doesn't have land but to live on their livestock and things like that so it's a new trend when everyone are farming everyone had the farm lands and it's active then they can't have cattle much and they can't have goats and sheep because there's no land to graze the gomalas are gone the gomalas are the lands which actually are dedicated traditionally for the grazing of the cattle and things like that so this is kind of a, is a it's a, is a kind of a indirect boom for a lot of people who are uh, into, of course a uh, lot of uh, landless uh, uh, farmers communities and uh, women especially go for work uh, working in this gated communities and things like that as the story of the other side uh, at least they should know two three languages now if they want to survive as a maid in bangalore uh, by default they have to they have to know hindi so women if she can't sp speak hindi she will be not taken to the work also you know things like that so uh, so people uh, we encourage the women at least to are grazing cattle in the wild i mean in the nature or in the, not tied out we don't buy far, milk from the uh, farmers who are uh, who are like more in farm scale and they tie the cattle all day and they feed one kind of a grass that farm grass or, and, and it's very bad so i observed in, la, in during my last 3 years of stay how even this holstein and jersey cows are unable to stand also forget about delivering milk and all that so when they are when they are fully pregnant i've seen four or five cows in two years that they they've collapsed and they couldn't get up also and they and they gone and the farmers lost money also on it so things like that so this is happening to the animal itself forget about us and uh, then uh, we also encourage uh, women to have a uh, desi hen in the things it's not that we we at the farm are able to grow everything because i mostly focus the more more on this pedagogy and thing things like that i'm unable to scale up and it's not my intention to scale up this farm but rather see it as a model and in the google maps when they ask for the tag i i proudly put it as a museum only because i know that but at the same time i have to show the numbers i have to show the profit to the other farmers to replicate this model so i'm hardcore that way as a vendor and i talk money and in art i couldn't talk money but here i have to talk money so that the other farmers can see the numbers that how much profit i'm making how much are my turkey berries costing you know so that's another story you can google search for saja prakaris for the other stories what we are focusing on this uh making uh, this local uh, uncultivated greens popular or uncultivated vegetables popular like turkey berries sundakai uh, what you call in tamil and uh, mantakalis and all these things so we are we are uh, uh, trying to and also when we are growing when we talk about local greens i'm, I'm not growing methi and palak at all but rather want to introduce the customers and other people other greens like our popular uh, package of greens which we want to sell also popular and proudly is about the something called berke sopu berke sopu is means mixed greens so the very knowledge of how women is to forage in the wild the same practice we do in the farm in the cultivation model also so these are the models or the clues as for something that farmers can see but till now after despite two and a half years of work in this place in this village i have still not touched or influenced the actual professional farmers who are making money out of growing vegetables so all these people who are come on board uh, unfortunately are the ones who have a little education or more education or who have who had a, some kind of an odd jobs in the city and they moved on to the farms in the retired life or uh, post covid life and they decided to 
realize some what, what they're doing and what they're not doing and things like that. young guys who are doing odd jobs now decided to do farming in their own lands and stay back in the village grow some mushrooms or grow some hen and chicken so we could influence only those people but the hardcore people who are making a lot of money uh, they still see me as one uh, teacher, teacher or master or something like that you know because i also happen to teach uh, azim prem university is next to a farm only so i happened i mean it's not my farm i rented a farm from my relatives so uh, we are very close to that so they see me is on teacher guy so he happens to talk like this and he'll talk he'll talk and preach like this so they would not consider me uh, either they are considering me too serious or they would not consider me as a as a competitor or somebody who is making money also so this is a, a flip side but i have patience to do and i don't know how long i can do it but it's a good side that uh, there's so much uh, students are interested and i'm talking to schools locally and things like that that wherever whenever i get an opportunity to teach art i rather teach gardening for them so try to set up uh, little garden patches and the way we see i told on the first day also this question this uh, the way we introduced uh, weaving and uh, uh, textile or uh, the basic hand skills like pottery and things like that uh, uh, i i wish that gardening or or to see how food is grown in front of us can inspire a lot of children to eat better and uh, live better thank you so so when the term comes when the uh, when the that one image please this is something i found yesterday so i have to keep it secret and saying it sharing it today thank you sure i should sir uh... I have, I would have already plenty of questions. <laughs> um still we it's we are a bit to move on. Um I just wanted maybe to ask you if, how do you organize a sharing and or selling uh, do you sell or are you sharing uh, the distribution also on the local level um in Bangalore to the projects of your farm? uh yes uh, during since i saw i told about this project uh, actually got into the farm scale from nursery scale uh, during the lockdown severe lockdown so me and my daughter were actually were locked down in the farm in a small space you, you could see that in the video that we are set up the kitchen and everything sleeping place was all same uh, so first thing was that for me the intention of selling was not the priority initially but unfortunately that guy was helping us in the gardening uh, he had no job and his wife also had lost her job so i wanted to continue to support him during that time so that's how what i did is and also there's no transport system at the time to bring him to the from the other village so what i did is on my scooter as to go him and get him from his village and back in the evening so that was the route actually i made it as my first delivery route to bring him and i'm going to bring him i would sell little vegetables what i have for the houses on the road so that's how it started and today we have two delivery people to deliver and also to take it to a warehouse nearby like a farmers on hap so that that goes to the other parts of the city also but very limited we would not grow very popular uh, things we would only grow what you want to grow and people are not happy but we have a beautiful whatsapp group there are like more than 300 people it's not that all 300 are buying but they are watching what i'm doing so it's a very potential audience and uh, today recently we started an art space like an art residency and an exhibition space uh, to promote artworks and art projects uh, we're working on theme of food and ecology and things like that so for me to set up this art space the audience are my customers so it's a vice versa and very soon after i go back i'll be setting up a farmers market in this art space so when i say come see art they would not come but i would when i say uh, come buy uh, good eggs and good milk or good vegetables the people will come i mean the commoners uh, around they would come so eventually they'll be guided to such projects or such awareness through the art space there so that way we have a very good system even just half an hour before i was coordinating to cut a hen <laughs> chicken and deliver today to a customer so i'm uh, that way i'm quite hardcore i mean to some of the people i even cook and also uh, deliver so that it's very emotional and very personal that way i am uh, uh, the customer base is built in last two and a half years so they're very nice they don't uh, argue with me or they don't uh, like the pizza no that they, if you are late they were sent back and all that or you're fine or you get pizza free no even if your milk spoiled 
uh, they're very humble to say Suresh Milk is spoiled, please uh, check. You know, so they're very humble and it's a kind of a very beautiful uh, 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 kind of customers they are. And if I personally, if our delivery person gets drunk and he doesn't deliver that day, if I go to deliver, definitely it will be two hours more because everyone will be greeting me and inviting me home and things like that. And um, thank you. Uh, and maybe uh, I ask the last one. And just also to reflect on yesterday's conversations, you were talking about a bit this, um, you know, nostalgia of like home food and you traveling and you you living in different region. And the, yesterday Vivek was also mentioning how to grow, you know, traveling plants in a way. Plants like he was talking about the, the wasabi or avocado ass, and it's also in a way. Um, bringing some home food for certain people here and try to grow it here in Kerala. And there was also um, Nora Oswest who was talking about decolonizing your plate. The, 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 the other way around is like we get, you know, international type of vegetables and we get used to some, um, let's say, diets that are not like really own diets. We eat, uh, I don't know, in Europe, it's like avocado a lot, and it's that uh, come from Latin America mostly. So she was talking also about how to decolonize your plate. I wanted to know how you react to those two, two let's say, interpretation of how do we relate to our food culture, food habits, whether we miss our own food or whether we have been colonized in our plate. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, for me, this whole exercise is much more on the not bringing stress uh, on the farming community and also on the land and the ecology around. So it's not more a, like a nationalist because we saw this with the, with the right wing regime now. A lot of people are talking always about this desi cows and desi seeds and desi knowledge and things. So I, I'm really not into that. Though I sound like when I talk and all those things, people think that I'm a vegetarian and I you know hardcore into this kind of a uh, nationalistic uh, approach to this. I, I'm very always clear. I eat beef and I eat everything and things like that. But there, there is this value in it, you know. So I only want to not just go back for the sake of going back. I'm seeing practicality that why our farmers are giving up farming despite having knowledge and despite having system, despite wanting to do farming. And the, where is the stress coming on, on their health and their psych and, the, and this whole farmer suicides happening and things like that. Because this farmer suicides is, is more of not the small, small farmers, actually. These are the farmers who are, uh, uh, in a way, uh, have a little uh, extra hope or, or they're into some kind of a plantations or there's some kind of a monocropping cult, uh, habits, you know, things like that. So the farmer who has a very small land or a small patch, uh, still more or less in a good conditions can grow little decent food to survive. It's not that they, these farmers are committing suicide because they didn't had food to eat or something like that. It is because they are kind of a, uh, kind of a forced to do certain practice now. You know, we are almost there. We have stolen certain kind of a life from them mm. with our dams and with a system we built around. So this is something that I'm trying to see. But what I say is I know that I, uh, with the kitchen, like today morning, I was talking to the school children. So what I basic I was telling them is that I know you can't grow sugar cane on your terrace. You can't grow your make sugar. I'm not into that kind of a thing. I'm just saying if your 70% or 80% of your food is safer, your uh, the rest of the 20, 30%, if it's junk, you can manage. Your body can cope with it. But if everything, if you give it to somebody else that they'll dictate what you eat, then we'll have nothing to eat. Then even the normal food and the green herb, which is uh, which is anybody's knowledge, anybody can grow and eat. And tomorrow you have to depend on the only as a capsule and a medicine for for the resources or the nutrition in your body. You know this is happening now. So we have Ayurveda, we have natural remedies, we have natural medicines which is based on the same knowledge what we are trying to do. But I don't want that to become somebody's specialist knowledge. I want that to be people's knowledge. So people should have control over that and people should grow that and they should consume that. So this all the solutions, what I'm talking through this herbal greens and vegetables is not a solution for some remedies in your body. It is that how women and people consumed on a daily basis so that they don't have to go to the doctor or to yeah. the specialist yeah. by paying money and making the resources abused there as a medicine. Yeah. And but, but talking about um, several generation families in agriculture. I mean, I talk myself, I uh, experience in my own family that, um, you know, my grandfather during Green Revolution, let's say in the 50s, 60s, 70s started, I mean, developed the, the farm and then 
uh, it was transmitted to my uncle and lately my cousin who took the farm back wanted to turn back the farm and the land to more organic practices and the middleman said no your father has signed contracts 20 years ago that you have to do this cabbage or this uh, cauliflower in a certain way with pesticide and stuff like that and you can't uh, really just change like this because it's been long-term contracts so this also about we talk about suicide and depression of certain families this goes on generations in the, the last 50 60 years so bringing new practices when you have the chance to do it not all farmers have actually can do that on their let's say larger lands or, or maybe you have a lot to say on that but uh, see, as I said, this project all started from the kitchen garden itself. And I said even many things, I, I, because in the art side, I'm seen more as an art activist, you know. But when I went back to this project, I went with a humble uh, feeling in it. I wouldn't, I'm not there as an eco-warrior or change things and things like that. I went there simply to archive the recipes. Yeah. In the process of archiving recipes, I realized that actually our recipes have survived, but the ingredients are gone. Why, why, I mean, I keep uh, very derogatorily saying, uh, no grandmothers and none of my aunts died with the recipes. They didn't have it as a secret. You know, the recipes still are the same, but why, why I'm losing or why we're feeling nostalgic about the taste and the thing is because the ingredients are not there. Yeah. It's not, I'm not talking about the spices. I'm talking about the very greens or the very vegetable, which is to give that flavor to you. Uh, when you are young, you know, 50 years back or 40 years back, today that ingredient is not there. That vegetable is no more in the same condition. Forget about the chemical and pollutant. The taste itself, mm -hmm. what these hybrid crops are giving to you, they are blank. So why would children eat the vegetables? So my solution is coming, or the, my, my question or the, my query is coming from that small grassroots level. Uh, then I'm uh, just uh, going everywhere for me as an academicians and, and theoreticians and things like that. So I'm really working at a very... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just how to act and, and, yeah. and to show how to be a, some kind of leverage yes. and political but it's, level it, for, but, yeah. for people who have been working in agriculture for decades. And it's unfortunately, right. I'm more... Uh, 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 I've been invited to do workshops with school children, a lot of organizations, institutions, and I feel that I'm very, I'm very optimistic that I I can inspire some people as I practice. Okay, so, yeah, I think it's a good one to to stop here. We we come back in a discussion later, and it's three o'clock, and I'm going to give now the floor to Gabriel. Ng uh, Gabriel is a associate professor in art history of uh, Franklin. University in Switzerland, uh, is current research. That's not Gabriel on the screen. <laughs> That's the team bucket later. Um, is current research interest rooted in contemporary aesthetic looks at the changing imaginaries of our interconnected global cultures? Um, in particular through industrial heritage, port cities and natural environments with particular case studies in Europe and Southeast Asia, paying attention to the potential of artistic research to open new spaces for cultural dialogue and innovation. His uh, recent publications include a co-edited volume on mobile souls. We heard about it on Wednesday. And, uh, and on marine team poetics from coast to interland, where you're probably going to give a bit of more words now. Um, Gabriel co-founded the Teti Group in 2011 and guides the group activities to this day. Gabriel, uh, we are uh, delighted to listen to you now. And welcome. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be able to uh, to join you uh, today. And many thanks to the organizers uh, for the invitation to participate. Um, uh, the Cauchy uh, Museums Biennale uh, to Ewan. Uh, and uh, Maya Minder, of course, uh, Neil White and Minavari. I'll try and share my screen, maybe. Um, yes. Um, and uh, yes, as Ewan said, I'm, I'm uh, also represent uh, uh, the TETI Group, um, which stands for Textures and Experiences of Transindustriality, and which runs uh, different types of projects in the forms of workshops, um, exhibitions, publications, um, and more recently, 
culinary uh, events, and I'm going to try and present some of those projects in this in this uh, in this presentation. I I do have a particular interest in maritime histories and spaces, and thank you for for mentioning our, our recent uh, um, publication, uh, Maritime Poetics from Coast to Interland, which I cheekingly uh, I suppose. Um, um, included in this in this slide uh, also to mention that it's um it's an open access so you can actually uh if you want to have a quick uh, look at it you can go on the, the transcript website and and sort of access it um but but i titled this um this uh, this short intervention notes on the migration of migration of recipes um which we, we were uh, just talking about interestingly uh, with susha here and their containers um and um, as part of this panel on food transportation, climate change, and ocean trades, today I would like to consider the implication of migration in culinary traditions in parallel to the vehicles of, their, of food transportation, um, using culinary and food activations to unfold historical and infrastructural uh, patterns, looking in particular at ports as a lens in which to observe evolving planetary implications and ending with a brief consideration of metabolic pressure uh, in the guise of an edible proposal. And I was also very interested in anyone's introductory uh, words here, um, also touching upon this metabolic uh, question. So I, uh, yeah, this starting point somehow uh, slightly conjectural was, uh, um, was in Valencia, um, which I had to, in Spain, which I had the opportunity to, to visit, visit recently. And, and uh, having ventured towards the, the port area, I find myself in a succession of marinas um, filled with sailing ships, with a number of restaurants offering traditional cuisine, um, uh, traditional local cuisine. And at the end of the promenade, this little cafe that you can see here, uh, um, with its interesting uh, sort of um, system of aperture, but of course, um, sort of uh, proposing beverages and tapas in, in a relaxed atmosphere. Um, but of course, in, in this sort of reused, revamped shipping container. I should say perhaps that I have had a um, a long-standing interest in small maritime cafes as repository of local cultures, evident in, well, food itself, of course, but also furniture, the images that you can find in, in those cafes. And Titi has had a couple of projects to explore uh, this, uh, this, um, this, um, this, this, the model of a cafe um, through a, uh, an eponymous, um, eponymously titled, you know, Maritime Cafe. Um, mixing maritime cultures with contemporary interventions, contemporary uh, artworks. I'm just showing you here some iterations of that, uh, which we did, well, two, of, two, well, the ones here on the left were made here on, in Zurich, with, where if you want uh, to have sea fish, obviously you need to engage some intermediate party. And the other one, which is not here, but I did uh, recently, more recently last year, was in uh, Hamburg, Germany. Well, I would have thought it would not be too difficult to get um, to get some fish for the fish soup, which I had planned to make. I did two, in fact. I did a, a, a vegetable soup and, and, a fi and a fish soup. But in fact, it was extremely difficult to get uh, to get uh, to get the fresh fish, you know, despite visiting the Altenaer fish market and having a chat with some uh, professional cooks in the area. They told me that well, you know, you, you, no one really gets them from from these from these markets but as uh, as even um, sort of um, uh, underline from larger uh, business um, uh, distribution networks in in valencia um, i learned a little bit about the local cuisine to go back to 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 the starting point in particular this name la cuina uh, del cabanal uh, named after this district bordering the sea um, la, um, of cabanal and uh, valencian uh, valencian Rice uh, also features prominently in this cuisine, and its history you can discover in a local museum, um, the Museum of Rice, the Museo del Arroz, housed in a former rice mill. Fish, to go back to it, in particular, abadejo, I'm not very uh, fluent, not at all fluent <laughs> Spanish speaker, uh, is a cod-type fish, which also features significantly in this cuisine. 
And while you can find some of the local catch in uh, the spectacular uh, early 20th century modernist market that is uh, uh, in, in the center of Valencia, somehow the, the shipping container reminds us that the fish industry hardly relies on sympathetic uh, fishing barges. And this is the view that you see here is just slightly turning the head from the from the little cafe that I was showing you. And in Valencia, you can see here that the beside be, beyond the Port de Plaisance with the, with the local sort of sailing ship, you have the uh, actual um, um, port terminal, which uh, signals here the intensity, of course, of 21st century maritime trade. A brief look. Uh, a brief look at European statistics uh, would confirm the scale of this global inter interpenetration and with Spain apparently ranked fourth in the world as importer of fish and seafood after the US, Japan and China. And um, this also ties into um, the, 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 um, um, our southern neighbors here um, uh, taste for the uh, for, for them for fishing um, products. Cod stories though, um, can stretch back in time in southern Europe. And if the Spanish like the fish, cod is also a national dish in its neighbor, Portugal. And I uh, visited a, this interesting museum uh, on, the, on, the, on the Portuguese coast in Ilavo, um, the Maritime Museum of Ilavo, which, which I think I understand the, the, the Portuguese or the locals call the Museu del Bacalao. Um, the, the Cod Museum, basically, um, which takes visitors on board the ships that from the 1930s onwards sailed to Canada and the Atlantic Northwest to fish the precious animal, seeing that the nearby waters had been already overfished and which almost inevitably also occurred in uh, the, North, uh, uh, the Atlantic Northwest in the 1990s as trawlers had replaced the damp and partly solitary fishing techniques used early in the century, which you can see here on the right hand side, well, if I understand the the um, the, um, uh, the display, you know, you, the, the man was sort of left for a number of hours on this on this on these little boats, and then came back to the main to the main uh, mother ship, which is on the on the left hand side with, with that catch. Um, and to change, um, um, sorry, I know I finish on this on this southern stories. Um, bacalao is not only a staple uh, food of signature dishes in Portugal and Spain, but also in the long traditions of cities such as Genoa in Italy with its Stoccafisso alla Genoese and Venice with, uh, with its uh, uh, celebrated bacalao mantecato. And here we are really talking about stockfish and the introduction of stockfish in local cuisine was possible through the conservation of dried salted cod of the long distance and reflective of the economic and political connections of these two port cities. To change geographical settings briefly, I, um, this made me think of a similar stories that I heard in Kaohsiung in the southern and largest port of Taiwan when visiting the, the Chijin kitchen project of artist Wu Mali who has been developing a dialogue with the inhabitants of the coastline uh, district. Um, the views here on the left-hand side are, um, are from Qijin, seeing uh, the, the big city of Kaohsiung uh, across the, uh, the, the water expanse. And on top is the stretch of land. It looks, you know, a little bit, you know, kind of beach-like beach area. Um, and indeed, it attracts a lot of, you know, uh, it, it attracts some tourism. Um, and people can easily mistake the, the village for a picturesque traditional fishing vill village when, as Mali uh, points out, most of its inhabitants are recent migrants and the local fishing vessel goes as far as the Pacific to bring back the squid so beloved by Taiwanese chef and customers. And um, I'm not going to go into it here, but she, she has been running this little uh, uh, commun communal kitchen here in Chijin, um, interviewing inhabitants, working with with food, also collecting stories um, and uh, as part of the um, of a community project there. But she and she has made some videos that that can be can be uh, still producing some videos in that respect. Um, 
I phrase this opening as connecting fish stories and perhaps fish stories would remind us of a celebrated work and meditation by the late Alan Sekula, uh, photographer, artist Alan Sekula, combining my attention to maritime infrastructural transformation, labor organization and environmental pressure catalyzed by the strategic forgotten spaces of the sea in the machinery of late 20th and early 20th century global economics. And from this, from the port, uh, maritime port, I want to sort of take you to a mountainous port. And I'm sort of, I'm sort of supposed to sort of got playing a little bit with this intri interesting idea of a virtual seas in the sense of, you know, how can you, uh, geographers have pointed out that you can also consider um, um, structural uh, qualities of certain spaces such as seas as quite shared or similar to what would be in, uh, in principle, their um, their nemesis, that is, say, deserts. Um, but the shipping container again appears as the ubiquitous, ubiquitous and ambiguous instrument of maritime tra trade. And this is also this container is what is uh, what I is connecting us to this uh, little uh, mountainous story here. It's sheer. Interchangeability, based on the successful efforts to standardize its feature in maritime transportation in the 1960s, also allows its proposing in alternate and non-commercial users. If the container is the channel of connectivity, ports and portals are revealing spaces through which to observe the form such connectivity takes and implies. And perhaps um, passes can do that uh, as well um, in a similar yet slightly different way. So last year, uh, Titi, and in this case myself, and uh, Anne-Laure Franchette um, developed an intervention in Ospenthal as part of the outdoor conference Traversing Topologies, organized by the Swiss Artistic Research Network. Now, I think I have a map just to give you a sense of, oops, no, it's later. Well, I'll just show you a map and I'll show you, uh, so you know a little bit where, where we are here. Um, it's located in the Alps, very close to the Gotha Pass, which connects northern to southern Switzerland. And our intervention was entitled A Pass into the Past. Traffic at the saint gotha uh, Pass rose dramatically in the late Middle Ages. The route became a bustling and strategic nexus between northern and southern Europe and beyond from the Mediterranean to the North Sea. Trade flourished around the newfound path, if tortuous and dangerous prior to the opening of the railway line in 1882. In the 20th century, um, tunnels and galleries have further increased the flow of goods along the axis. And to consider the resonance of commerce at the past, edible were proposed to the participant during the Saturday walk. Through the eating of historical recipes and products, we hope to bodily connect with the cultural histories of the saint gothard to physically travel into the past, listening to distant voices, culminating in a reenactment of past economic and social heritage that keeps on informing the present. So there were two recipes. Um, also, uh, um, this was happening in a, uh, in a hike. So we had to, and there were 50 people. So it was, you know, we didn't, you know, it, uh, it was a taster, you could say, more than a, a full meal as we carried the, the whole thing. Um, so one of them was these little coin-shaped cheese scones. Flour, water, mustard, salt, and Valpura cheese, which is a local uh, cheese, very much, um, very much produced in the, uh, in the nearby valleys. The first edible aim to evoke the trading past of the Gotha and more specifically its taxation history. From the first development of the North-South Passage in the 30th century, uh, towns and regional authorities established numerous custom points in the area. To the north, cities such as Basel and Luzern, and to the south, Lugano and Como. Their merchants had to pay their way for the goods desired, and I, I, I think this notion of desire that was uh, also mentioned uh, uh, by Sua Chalion is, is very interesting, of course, and important um, uh, on both sides of the Alps. What kind of products? Well, again, also, as mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, 
um, textile, linen from Burgundy and South Germany, English wool, clothes from Ghent and Brussels, coal, coal and mains, and of course edibles, including salt, salted hearings, cured meat, grain oat, um, and so on. Animals as well, such as horses, cows, goats, sheep, um, to mention a few. The scones suggested a form of staple food as well that travelers along the mountain pass could rely on. Uh, the thin spherical shape alluded to coin, coins, money, used to pay the custom points. Um, the greater cheese, as I said, was from Valpura, very much a local production. And additionally, I just kind of researching a little bit about it, I found out that, um, you know, historians uh, point out that uh, cheese was also used in the medieval ages uh, as exchange value, as an alternate to, to money. So people would also, you know, pay their, uh, with cheese directly. So that was kind of the, the first re the first recipe, kind of trying to go back to this history and to this filiation of food transportation and uh, commercial networks. The second is this ship container shaped cardamom and almond cake um, with ingredients, flour, sugar, almonds, milk, egg, and grated cardamom. We were staying in the nearby city of Bilinsona, and it didn't include a photograph here, but we had a great view of the rail tracks of this Lugano Zurich with this, this southern, northern, north, south route. And when, you, when you're really on the tracks, what is really noticeable is the, uh, bes beside the, the, um, the, the, the civilians uh, train is, a, is the passage of of a of a, of a transportation tr good transportation trains from the Mediterranean world to Germany. Um, we're still quite a long way from the sea and the port of Genoa, yet uh, a maritime feel accompanies the presence of these enigmatic rectangular boxes. So, well, I'm sorry, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, as you, this rail tracks, of course, this rail convoys are, of course, filled with the, the shipping containers, uh, as we know, have been standardized from the uh, maritime uh, maritime ships to 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 go to go on the. Um, to fit the, the 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 rail tracks, of course. So, with you know, when you see those, you're a bit like, well, what mysteries from distant land might be on their way to the northern markets? And of course, this is also an old story. Uh, distant goods were long transported along the so-called uh, Silk Roads connecting Asia to Europe, Europa. And amongst again the different things that you see, you know, back from you know five six centuries, um, salt, corn, oil. Uh, rice, um, um, uh, almonds, later on sugar, coffee, cacao, um, Switzerland, you know, chocolate country, but of course it doesn't uh, grow in, in the in, in the Alps, um, and spices, um, and many spices, of course, pepper, uh, um, 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 I've got all this in German, so I'm just trying to, um, uh, muscat, saffron, and, uh, cardamom, uh, as well, of course, which was kind of our, our link here. So in that spirit, we baked a variation of a Swedish almond and cardamom cake to allude to the spice route that connected, uh, these distant places. They were, these were made roughly in the shape of shipping containers. We, we also, we cut them uh, to 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 hand to to hand out to all these people, um, taking in the contemporary global routes that continue to bind the world together. And as just a footnote to this recipe, I um, just mentioned that this I kind of discovered this really quite quite tasty uh, little Swedish cake as part of a project I was participating in. Uh, in an exhibition organized by the artist Cora Piantoni and Dorota Lukianska in Gothenburg, um, to which I contributed an audio piece entitled Souvenirs from Guangzhou, um, which you can hear on the Titi Vimeo site if you're interested, uh, which, which was revisiting basically the voyage of a first Swedish East India company, Supercargo, uh, in the 17th century to China via the Straits of Malacca. So in any case, the scone and the cake were two proposals to try and create a passage into the past of good transportation, and in particular food transportation, as it comes to inform and question the present. The third and 
uh, final point uh, goes back to also uh, to this notion of metabolism. Um, and, and I would like just to, to mention here, I echo also to your discussion on uh, community organization and participation, um, but uh, I, I hope to hear more about as well. Another set of edible interventions TT was involved as in as an extension of our publication Mobile uh, Soils. Uh, this is the one that we published through this new set of uh, TT Press, and I'm not going to go talk uh, too much about it because Anne Laure uh, already uh, had um, um, shared some thoughts on the on, on the on the book. It's a collective endeavor uh, that explored territorial transformations in the global age, um, and um, uh, through. Um, with a 18 texts with a range of different perspectives from artists to scientists to historians uh, and um, uh, and so on. So quite very quite inter interdisciplinary. But in the last two years, we organised also a number of dinners, in altogether six dinners, I'm told, to unfold the book in uh, edible form, collaborating along the way with the SA Greenhouse Lab at the University of Zurich. With La Beck uh, Artist Residency, it's also in Switzerland, the Grand Palais Berne, we made a dinner there, as well as the organization uh, Arvae and uh, Food Culture Days. And I understand Margot Schwab is to speak uh, later today. Um, and finally, on curating, which is um, the, the, for which we made a dinner, which I'll um, say just a few words uh, here at the invitation of curators Alexandra Romy and Giulia Bussetti, who invited us to respond to the ongoing then documented theme of compost um, in organizing similarly a dinner based on the publication for circa 25 uh, people. Um, and the intervention I uh, titled, we titled, um, well, um, in, uh, in French, originally, sol brouillé et remonté, uh, which in English would uh, go as kind of scrambled and whipped soils. Basically, the dinner was composed of ingredients indicated by the office. I wrote to all the office saying, well, could you give me an ingredient that you think would represent, you know, the food that, um, that would represent the substance of a text that you are talking about? And, you know, uh, we had, some texts that were on agriculture, for instance, Ben Abderazik on tomato, but we had some text, for instance, on uranium uh, by, by uh, Grit Ruland, for instance. So we were quite different. But everyone bought, gave me one ingredient, some cases several, that would incarnate the content of their uh, chapter. Uh, here, maybe it's just to give you a better idea. We, and from this list, you can see here on the on the on the left hand side. Um, I composed a menu uh, which we duly proceeded to cook and serve in a one evening uh, session. Um, they are organized by the different parts in this book. Uh, well, there's what, three parts on the ground, ground, other ground. And so, but then the principle was that no, no ingredient was to be left alone. So um, all the, the rather simple dishes that uh, I ended up preparing were the result of a, of a combination of these ingredients. So the contents of the book and the dinner were thus in the first stage scrambled before being whipped together for edible purposes. Um, I also asked uh, authors to say a few, to if they could explain in a few words why they chose this, their, um, their ingredients, and you have a, uh, and we I made a little sort of video slideshow that was screened in the, in the room. You can see here, uh, uh, this is Monica Yosina Yaga's uh, choice on, on a beetroot, and she's saying a few words about, uh, about what she chose them, and, and this was kind of ongoing. Um, going back to our focus on food transportation and eco ecological pressure, what was striking in that process was what I would call the metabolic relation at play on both a very local, intimate, one could say, level, and a larger macro planetary level, which reflected the author's interest, concerns, and work. Um, in uh, their critical observation of what Paolo Peruri called uh, in an eponymous publication a terra mobile, um, where the designation of anchorage and the design of collective organizational strategies of our societies, of our, you know, of our planet is suddenly to be, to be defined anew in a time of implosion 
explosion to borrow the title of the uh, volume edited by Neil Brenner. Tomatoes, uh, that's Kenza's Ben Abdelazik shows, yes, but grown in the local Zurich greenhouse. Chlorophyll, Loridalada, the substance of life, oregano, uh, by, chosen by Nikos Doulos, uh, a reminder of his promenade into the uh, underground of uh, the uh, of Athens um, uh, soil, as well as green onions. At the heart of Uriel Zolo's discussion of the maraîcher, the, the food sellers uh, in uh, Aubervilliers, in the suburb, suburbs of Paris, tying France to its colonial to its colonial expansions. Sorghum in Paloma Ayala's practice, a recurrent staple to evoke endurental pressure in her native Mexico. I won't go further, but uh, and here you have a little bit of the, the the final simple dishes that we came up with, and I through the different the different. Uh, the, the different sets I, I introduced a little bit, you know, what was happening and how these, what we were eating was tied to different sets of, um, uh, of issues, if you wish. Um, to say that the metabolic operation as evident in our current planetary condition ties in prob problematic, challenging, but also creatively hybrid modes and questions, the negotiation of local, local and global. And it was really interesting this point, uh, uh, this take uh, that uh, Swash was making on, on 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 hybridity in his in his uh, in his farm, I think, um, not least in the actual manifestation of its containers that implemented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, maybe just one question. Um, seems like um, the plate is a great st storyteller for you. <laughs> um, and make me think of yesterday dinner again. We, my, my, Angela was sitting next to me, was having Shrimp Mozambique and the Portuguese with the Portuguese rice. These three, those four words already give a, quite a story. Um, have you looked a bit at uh, Kochi uh, in that sense uh, of the plate can give a story? Here, shrimps from Mozambique or in the way of cooking as Mozambique cook, and same the Portuguese rice. Here, of course, Portuguese had a, a presence uh, like a few centuries ago. And um, would you? Have a, something to say or organize this? Um, I ha I haven't uh, really, but yes, of course, I, I'm aware of the the um, of the, the Portuguese uh, the, the Portuguese ties uh, here, and and indeed, so so that's kind of related to a little bit this question of um, hybridity, maybe as a sort of you know the different sides of it. I think that can be can be you know um, can be kind of. Uh, assessed for, and for sure, they, you know, are looking at these different types of recipes. I'm quite interested in how they, they sort of, uh, they, they can reveal the sort of, sort of the historical paths. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, evaluation is, is sort of a bit, a bit difficult, but certainly in, in how they construct us or, you know, or construct, you know, a certain place, certain cultures and, and so on. Um, so, so yeah, and, and hopefully I can learn more about it. For instance, the, the Portuguese like to talk about the six continent, the the imaginary continent of uh, Portuguese uh, roots, Mozambique being one, or Kochi or so. So they have this, uh, uh, let's say, rather poetic uh, way of reading uh, of that. So. Yeah, I was reflecting Mozambique being also part of the sixth continent in a way. So, okay, <laughs> um, we're gonna. It's three thirty. We have one one hour left to go, even a bit less. So I will move on now to um, Rob Lafrenet. Um, we're speaking uh, from France. Rob was a uh, visiting Kochi uh, Biennale in the past. That's part of the Future of Transportation program set with. Srishti, he has been a contemporary art curator for the last 35 years, working internationally and creatively with artists entirely on original commissions. He has recently curated exhibitions in the US, Scotland, France, Liverpool, Doncaster, and Mexico, Taiwan, 
and India. From 97 and 2014, he was a curator of the Arts Catalyst. We heard the Arts Catalyst yesterday in the um, um, Living Pedagogy panel. He co-founded the Future of Trans Transportation Project at Srishti Institute in 2014. Uh, we are involved in creating project here at the Kochi Museum's Biennale, the last two editions. He also writes for Makery.info, magazine I uh, being editor-in-chief. And we co, Rob and me co-edited recently a book called Space Without Rockets on a totally different topics, but on the impact of rocketry, rockets on climate change. Rob, I leave you the floor. Welcome. You're muted for now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm speaking today from the Valais du Tarn. In Occitanie, um, I'm in on a river, very close to a river, and um, I. It's interesting to see all those presentations from Suresh and Gabriel. And um, on French time, I haven't yet had breakfast, so both of those presentations have made me feel very hungry, with all those wonderful pictures of of, of food. Um, I'm going to talk about the history of the Future of Transportation project, which um, goes back both to Bangalore and uh, Shristi and to the Kochi Biennale. Um, but um, before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the strange I, I, um, circle that I find myself in, generational circle, um, finding myself here back in France after my ancestors left France in the um, 18th century to try to um, colonize India, my French ancestors, that, that, that is. And my name, you will see, is La Frene. Um, and I spent a lot of time here in France explaining to them why I sound like an Englishman um, rather than a Frenchman with a French name. And the reason for that is that the Lafrenes, for one reason or the or another, travelled? Um, we think possibly from Normandy or even Brittany, where Ewan is from, to India and landed on the Malabar coast, where you're all there in real time. Um, in Calicut, my father, um, Cyril Herbert Lafrené, was born at sea. I understand. Um, on the way possibly from the Andaman Islands and was um, christened in Calicut Cathedral. I've seen the entry in the cathedral. I've been traveling to Kerala quite a lot in my life to try and find my relatives. On my last visit to Kochi to take part in the Kochi Biennale in 2017, I made contact with a number of Lafrenes because there are many Lafrenes actually um, Anglo-Indian families in Kochi itself. And I, just, I had a very nice meeting with a man called Richard Lafrané, who lives in Cochin, Kochi rather. Um, so talking about this very strange circularity going on here, my father was demobilized after the Second World War and arrived in England. Um, he never took an aeroplane. He arrived, um, he went by from by ship from India, from Bombay, to Egypt, where he fought as a sapper, as an engineer. He trained as an engineer in, in, in India. And on arrival in Britain after the Second World War, he never left. He never left that country. Um, and I feel... Like having arrived back in the French countryside and being here during <clears throat> the pandemic, um, where in France we were actually not allowed to move more than one kilometer away from our homes, um, with the um, move more than one kilometer away from our homes, I found myself discovering all these little highways and byways and areas around the river. And I also started buying vegetables from a local farmer called Sandrine. Um, she um, is an organic farmer and inherited the farm from her 
parents who were also far farming the land. So on an electric bicycle, I was allowed to travel. There were many tales in France of people traveling on their bicycles for pleasure, but putting a baguette on the back so that you could justify that traveling outside the one kilometer margin during the pandemic to you were allowed to go shopping but you weren't allowed to take exercise outside one kilometer so i used to ride my electric bicycle to chandrine's farm and source my food locally and one of the um things about the pandemic is that it did make me think about this concept that was um actually thought about my by my partner who's a climate activist the idea that um perhaps in a different kind of world, we we might only venture <clears throat> the, the distance of a day's walk from where we live. So following on from that, um, <clears throat> um, I'd like to, to, to point out that I'm not with you today because, as Mina said in her opening address, I've uh, used up my quota of flying. I no longer I haven't flown since 2019. And I haven't got into an aeroplane. And I really would love to come back to Kochi again. But if I do, it will be on a ship if that is ever going to be possible. I, I don't fly. Okay, so with that personal introduction, I'm going to share my screen and talk to you a little bit about the history of the Future of Transportation project. Again, Reflecting back on, on, on the first day, um, <clears throat> Maya mentioned the Hacteria network. Uh, the future of transportation is not even a network. It's a kind of a concept and it's a Facebook group and it's a pedagogical process. But it's not like founded. It's not a company. It's not, it, does, it doesn't have any economic existence. It's, it, it's simply a concept. Um, so, but it does have a history going back to 2014, and it started at, at Shrifty. I'm also going to say in the context of today's discussion that um, it's not actually about food transportation. Um, it's about human transportation. And um, I'm not a great expert in food or trade routes, although I have um, organized conferences that, that have involved um, things like um, fair, fair, uh, um, <coughs> sailing cargo ships. And so I, I'm very aware of this, but the future of transportation, <coughs> I have to be honest, is more about human transportation. I'm going to share my screen now and talk to you a little bit about um, the, the background. And so I give this lecture, and I've been giving it for the last sort of eight or nine years called Bicycling on Mars. And... Um, it, it, it's basically, um, can everybody see this, um, about the idea of um, a kind of an impossibility of moving around the planet. And we're starting with this problem, this problem, which is obviously in taken in on the, the highway in Los Angeles. Um, how do we move about the planet sustainably? How can we change our patterns about and how more importantly uh, about moving about the planet and how more importantly how can artists sort of play a part in 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 in, in that issue and so <clears throat> the concept of future transportation the actual term and it's um it's been called various things i mean Suresh calls it more like the future of transport so future transportation actually was a term invented by Mina Vari um, when I proposed this notion of um, making art and this notion of a pedagogical process around mobilities. Um, so I, I think Mina invented the term. Anyway, whatever, we have that term. But the other very important person um, in terms of the future of transportation was um, the late Sadiptu Dasgupta. Here he is. Um, but I'm just going to go back to this image here, because this is an image that Sudipto used to show his students at Shrishti. And it's, um, we've been talking about hybrids today. And I think this woman on a sari on a skateboard, um, getting a lift from a bicycle rickshaw, um, presumably in 
<coughs> Calcutta, because that's where they have bicycle rickshaws, he would introduce this to his students as a, as a notion of hybridity about transport. And Suresh himself was extremely interested in the, the micro movement of transport. When I first went to Bangalore, I was sort of amazed to find um, that within a city, because it was so difficult to move around, uh, people use Skype, that's what they used then before Zoom, to literally have meetings um, around the city because it was so difficult to get around Bangalore. And um, so Dipto, here he is again, introduced this sort of I idea. I I'm just going to deviate a bit from my main theme just to show one of his works. This is, uh, he used to make these impossible sort of velocipedes, bicycles, and um, here's a group of kids sort of um, interacting with one of his artworks. He, he was a great inspirer of students, I think, but also very good at connecting with the communities around Yelahanka and um, Bangalore. And um, he introduced me also to this concept um, of the Indian basic bicycle, which um, I, 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 is used all over in the transport. And also, I, I suppose this is where I was inspired by this bicycling on Mars thing. This Indian basic, you see it everywhere. It's like, it, it's just used for everything. But the interesting thing about this particular picture of an Indian basic is that it's a railway station. Now, this railway station, as Sadiptu pointed out to me, <clears throat> um, is very, very close to Bangalore International Airport, but it's not used. There's a massive highway out to Bangalore International Airport and a, and a railway line. There could be trains to that airport, but there aren't. So in order to kind of think a little bit about this, we took a bunch of Srishti kids, as they call the undergraduates there, for their first lesson, <clears throat> and the first, well, they're not exactly lessons, because everything in Srishti is kind of collaborations, as, as, as Gita pointed out, um, again, on the first day of this, um, of the soil assembly, that, that, the, the, the pedagogical notion of Srishti is, is, is about the students actually um, collaborating on their own projects, not just being t taught what, what to think. And um, here at the inspiration, on the inspiration of Sadiptu Dasgupta, we took our first um, a cohort of students down to the station at Yellowhanker Junction and did our first session on a train. Um, so this, at that point, I was actually <coughs> developing an exhibition in France on the Lot Valley, another valley near me, uh, River Valley, the Valley of the Lot. And um, I was developing an exhibition with a number of artists called Exoplanet Lot. And the idea was to imagine um, another starting on a new planet, starting on a planet where we could rethink the technology in terms of past technologies. And so the idea was that these students were all told they weren't allowed to take their phones, they weren't allowed to use any electronics. They had to get on the train with a... They could take cameras but and, and a notebook... And they would have to get on this train, there's Sedepto on the train. Um, they could get on they had to get on the train and imagine they were on a different planet in in order to think. We did this with two lots of, of students. Um I'll go back to that image. This is the second lot of students. Um and this is the group of students that actually came to the Kochi Biennale to work with uh, the Mexican artist Tanya Candiani, whose work I'll show in a minute. But the idea was that the railway carriage as a classroom. So here we have a mixture of students and ordinary people um, interacting um, on a suburban train going outside of Bangalore. Um, and just going back to, to this image, um, Sidepto was also a member of... Um, of an activist groups who had the idea of trying to 
<clears throat> trying to to, to 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 demonstrate to the the central government in India that there there were these mainline trains going in and out of Bangalore, but they were passing through all these congested suburban stations. And so this is a demonstration on Cantonment Station by a, an activist group of commuters, people who are trying to get out to to work every day on these incredibly crowded roads, that they could actually, if this train that you see here could stop near their workplace, they could get to work in about a third of the time. So this is a demonstration by commuters on on on, on Cantonment Station that uh, that 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 Sadiptu was part of this movement. Um, and then we see the uh, the interface with the metro. And uh, the last project I did um, with uh, this is the Bangalore Met the interface between the main station and the Bangalore metro. And um, the last project I did again during the pandemic was with the Art in Transit group, um, who are making work in Bangalore uh, about and on the metro itself. So this group of students that I that we took on the trains with um, with with this Sedupto. Um, we also talked a bit about um, the whole notion of activism um, and reclaiming the streets. Uh, I was part of the Reclaim the Streets movement in London, and a very enterprising this very enterprising cadre of students um, decided they were going to close off the streets around Bangalore. So in around the the Shristi campus in in in, in Yellowhanka in Bangalore, and they, they 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 wrote a letter which they took to the local police station. They went around and talked to all the residents, and it was quite a radical act to just close down all the streets around Bangalore. And they spoke to the local community. They developed street games for for young people around. So this is a very rare sight, traffic free. Around Bangalore, this is one of the students. Um, they 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 built this kind of outdoor adventure playground um, in the streets of Anushrishti. And another group of, of students who were working on the um, future of transportation theme <clears throat> did a whole project about time banking. Um, they, they 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 set up an exercise bicycle and. In exchange for 15 minutes of riding on the exercise bicycle, they could get free tickets on the on, on the Bangalore Metro, or they um, got these service credits from doing some cycling. And as a result of, of, of doing that that time banking work, they could get a lift on the back of this Indian base by basic bicycle by me. Um, as one of the lecturers, uh, uh, I spent the day giving people rides around the area on, on this Indian basic bike. So this first manifestation of the future of transportation led to a Facebook group called the Future of Transportation. Um, oh, sorry, just to, to go back to this final um, image, so uh, jumping ahead of myself here. So this is a group of local kids. and. Um, there's a very interesting story here. Um, this car, okay, so we, we, we tried to clear all the cars away from the, the, the Shrishti campus, but this one car, the owners had gone away for a year and just left the car. So we decided to go to a wedding shop and decorate the car and turn it into an artwork, and these kids helped us do that. So um, I, I'm just showing you this image, which was posted recently on the Future Transport Facebook group which is actually about the fact that in Holland, you know, we now see all these traffic-free streets and the domination of the bicycle as a kind of an official policy. But um, Joost Rietveld, who's one of the uh, regular posters on, on Future of Transportation um, Facebook group, was showing this historic picture from the 70s. I mean, I talked about reclaimed streets, but in the 70s, the Dutch activists were doing things like this to close off the streets so the, the point being that in this kind of activism you know it has a history it goes back to direct action like these students were doing in, in, in Shristi so here's the future of transportation um, 
Facebook group currently members about 3,203. A lot of very active posters. One of the most active posters is the performance artist Dimple B. Shah, who's based in Bangalore. And um, I, I was actually looking through the group last night just to get pictures of food because I thought somehow we, we, we need to kind of connect to the theme of soil assembly. And this is the one, this wonderful one of, of, of carrots being transported. Um, this is a very, this is just a post coming from one of the members. Um, you know, I, I don't know who posted this, but this one I found is from Suresh, which, uh, who we've just heard a fascinating talk um, about his farming activities. As you can see, it's another train. And uh, Suresh Kumarji posted this. Uh, this is a train where vegetables are being sold. Um, wonderful image. Um, so, yeah, future transportation came to, uh, officially came to Kochi in 2017. It's part of the Shrishti outpost curated by Mina. And um, we had a whole sort of pavilion. So we were able to turn future transportation was, 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 was not just a concept at this point, it became a building. And this is um, the Shrishti outpost. We can see below this auto rickshaw that was converted by the French artist Thomas Las Bouges. And so this became a focus for a number of future of transportation activities by Shrishti students and by um three artists uh sorry four artists who were who, who took part sedipto gastascupta um thomas les Bouges, who created this ritual um uh tanya kandiani and and suresh himself and this is uh this is the kind of atmosphere what the place looked like uh me, me sporting a fab india t uh, fab india shirt one of my favorites um and this is actually the visit to our our, 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 um, our pavilion by lewis biggs who's was the director of the folkestone triennale in, in the uk and this is the ritual uh, basically moving around with various bits of technology attached gps um yeah, and Thomas actually did a wonderful thing with this, with, with, with the ritual drivers that he, he got together for his finale with four ritual drivers and, 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 and built a drive in cinema down by those nets that you've all seen in, in Kochi. He is rigging it up. He is Gita about to take an inaugural ride in, uh, Thomas's ritual. And yeah. Generally speaking, the future of transportation here became a building, but it didn't only just, only just become a building, it became a, a department, which is uh, basically the Department of the Future of Transports, created by Suresh. And the idea here was a group of the Shrifty students actually were working on collecting traveling stories, commuter stories, and they spent a lot of time around bus stations and train stations interviewing people about they had these fake um lanyards was, we'll see another lanyard at the end i think lanyards are a very interesting piece of artwork um this student yash jane was his, his fake lanyard at the department of future transportation to make it look really official to actually go and interview interview commuters and find out what their stories are how they got to work i think it's absolutely fascinating to see what suresh is doing now with his farm and what he did during the, the lockdown because to me it connects directly to this project of this connection this, this between the human the human activity what we have to do for food what we have to do to live and our narratives, our daily narratives of, 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 of how that connects to his art. And I, I, he hasn't mentioned it in his talk, but I think one of the most classical pieces of world performance art is where Suresh um, dismantled his father's bicycle and then reassembled it as part of a performance. Um, I, I think that to me, that's another symbol, if you like, of bicycling on Mars or the future of transportation. So Tanya Kandiani, we see her here in zero gravity. Um, 
I won't talk much about zero gravity now because I don't think it's in this tight age of climate disaster, it's not a great idea to do work on diving aircraft anymore. Though you and and I have both been on these uh, um, uh, these in the ocean um, parabolic flights in a happier age where we felt we could actually um, um, do this sort of thing uh, to simulate 30 seconds of zero gravity um, in this vehicle that's used to train cosmonauts and astronauts. Um, Tanya was basically recreating this um, early flight by a French lock, lock, locksmith, Besnier, and you see she's got the same, sorry, the same apparatus in zero G. Um, but I, I, I'll talk more about her um, interest in kind of the the, the 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 odd corners of technology. This is a, an illustration from um, a hot air ballooning competition in Lyon that inspired her work that she did actually for exoplanet lot um which we did in the lot valley which was this notion that um somehow you could have this flying boat but this is what she did um for the uh, uh, the coach biennale um she worked with a number of students um to create a vimana which i think many of you know was this uh sort of uh, epic notion from the Sanskrit epics, from the of the, 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 the notion that the the ancients in India had these flying vehicles, uh, which were like flying saucers, and so she created with the students a vimana in um, the, 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 this, this amazing uh, space in, in Kochi, and this is the bunch of students that she worked with um, in in front of the vimana that they had built. Also, um, on the future of transportation, we uh, we had lectures by um, Andres Padilla, Don Mene, and Ivan Puig. And I'll just mention their project briefly, um, because I think it connects again to this question of both human and food transportation. They, um, uh, in, in the 90s, um, the Hold entire... On. Yes? Hello? Yeah, uh, it's... We've been running for 30 minutes. It's four o'clock. We have little time left. To, to yeah. Have... Okay. I'm timing myself and I think I've been going about 15 minutes, but I'll keep, I'll go a bit faster. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, the, this vehicle, which is the, um, a road rail vehicle, um, and, uh, was used to go across here. We see it leaving Mexico City and cross the abandoned railroads of, of Mexico. In the nineties, the, um, the Mexican railway system was privatized and as a result, the entire passenger network closed down overnight. So they used this futuristic back to the future vehicle to explore the rail network and also interact with the communities and find out what their stories were. And um, the, the, here they see that they are again on Mars. And, and this is um, moving on quickly. Um, you, you, you asked um, briefly about um, the Erosine project, I think, Tim. Um, this is um, the Museo Aerosola by Thomas Saraceno, again, connecting to this human transportation notion. The, um, the Aerosene project that I curated and Ewan was there in White Sands, New Mexico. And this led to the book that meant Ewan mentioned earlier, Space Without Rockets. That was published this year and launched at the International Astronautical um, Congress in, in Paris. Um, this is an artist from, uh, he's not an artist, he's an engineer from Bangalore, who I um, invited recently to give a talk um, in, um, in, in um, Doncaster, UK, um, Naveen Rabelli, who created this solar powered ritual that he travelled all the way from Bangalore to London in. And I think this is another really excellent, this is Project Tejas, another really inspiring project. Now, the interesting thing, again, relating to food and transportation was that he lived in his auto ritual. Um, and um, the solar technology didn't fully work. So he had to stop off in villages all the way. Here he is in Iran, I think, 
all the way um, to London and charge his vehicle up. And as a result, he, he, he got food from the villagers and told his story about why he's transporting himself in this solar rickshaw all the way from Bangalore to, 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 to London eventually. Um, this is an early article I wrote on at Makery, again about the floating aspect of this, artists on the water. Um, this is anti latinan with his um, It's My Island um, then project that he, he, he did in the Baltic, and this is him doing it in London, being apprehended by the police because he went a bit too far to the spies headquarters, which you can see behind MI6. And this is me in my single skull rowing boat and doing the performance close to the water in Finland and again in Doncaster this year. And the project with Neil White, who is there, called um, Road Lab, which was inspired by Buckminster Fuller's um, um, rowing needles, which you can see in the top right hand corner. Um, it's a hybrid project which has never actually taken place, but the idea is that it's um, a contingency vehicle for going into, into disaster situations and is rowed by humans as opposed to any kind of sail or other kind of technology. And finally, the project I'm doing at the moment, I'm about to go off and um, work on it next week, um, which is Let the Birds Have the Skies with the composer Lola Perrin, where we're traveling around Europe's airline, uh, uh, Europe's railways, and we're going down into Spain next week to interview passengers on why they've chosen the train over the plane. And this is um, us working on the Thales train about three weeks ago in the cafe. And I think one of the important things about encouraging people to take the train rather than the plane is the fact that you can have very nice food on trains. And this is us working in the bar on the Thales interviewing interviewing passengers. So this is an, I'm only showing this, I know it's not got a lot to do with food transportation, although it is happening in a cafe, or the moving cafe. It's a project I'm doing, an artistic project I'm doing right now at 30 kilometers an hour as TGV, the TGV goes. So thanks a lot for listening to me, a few diverse projects here and Oh, yeah, this is just a, um, we were doing uh, also interviewing people at the WF in Davos again a few weeks ago. Thank you. That's it from me. Bye bye. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. It's fascinating. Also, this uh, project traveling from India to UK in a solar rickshaw. I really liked that one when it was published in Mercury. Okay, we're going to. Give the floor to Tim. We are running late, but uh, I guess Tim, it's already good. You take also your time, and we might prolong a little bit. Um, so, Times Up is an Austrian organization investigating the future every day. Times Up creates explorator, explorable spaces in the context of possible <coughs> building physical stories that explore contemporary socio-political issues. Um, in their talk, Time's Up will look at some of the emerging network of smaller trades operating at the fossil fuel free end of the shipping spectrum. I will let you, um, Tim talking. Tim is in Australia currently. So he's a bit, it's two, uh, one hour and a half ahead of us. Hello, Tim. <laughs> good, good afternoon. Cause it is afternoon for me still. Cool. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, very interesting to be on the uh, another corner of the Indian Ocean, uh, waving at you across the in a bit of Australia that uh, in Gondwana land was actually attached to India a long time ago. Um, so I'll try and keep things short. So we've got a bit of time for discussion. Uh, the um, one of the big sort of questions is sort of like why what's this sort of like freight and food things got to do with each other and uh one of the observations that comes from a very old times is that uh 
urban spaces, and we all are becoming becoming an urban civilization, uh, need transport of foods because we can't grow foods in, in cities. So one of the things that we need to do is get foods into cities. And um, it's interesting. Uh, we need to, by doing that, we need to transport them. One of the uh, biggest contributors to ocean plastics, to microplastics in the ocean, are car tires, like 28% of microplastic comes from car tires, truck tires, uh, which is quite outrageous. Um, the only thing that gives more, put more in there is uh, washing plastic textiles. So I was very glad to hear Suresh talking about cotton uh, shirts recently. It was very nice to hear. Um, another one of the reasons that we want is not only do we need to get stuff into cities, but we like to eat food that comes a bit further away. We talked uh, briefly about eating uh, local food and in-season food, and that does get a bit boring. And even if it's just the question of where do we get our pepper from. Um, but cargo is problematic. It's got all sorts of issues with it. As we can see, stinking uh, freight ships, um, even just the shipping industry uh, creates somewhere between two and a half and three percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and the fuel that they use is the is dreadful fuel from the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the bucket, so to speak. It's filled with heavy metal, so the northern part of Malta is poisoned with vanadium um, from all the ships passing by. There are sulfur oxides, nitrous oxides, black carbon that's um, accelerating the melting of the Arctic, and a whole bunch of other bad things. So ships, airplanes, bad ships as we know them are not so much are not so much better. Um, and there's just a lot of things that we transport. So one of the things that we, uh, for instance, an example something that's ridiculously transported is in Scotland, they catch fish, which they freeze, put in a container, sent to China to get filleted and sent back to Scotland to be sold at your Tesco's or any, anywhere else. Um, so the amount of ridiculous transport that we're doing is quite outrageous. Um, really interesting to see Rob talking about rail transport, which is, of course, uh, very fantastic. Um, it's very ecological, it's got a lot of good things about it, um, but there's a lot of infrastructure investments that need to be made and a lot of countries like Mexico and the UK are busy destroying their their um, rail infrastructure. So how can we do cargo that's a bit less messy? How can we get our, um, our things that we want? Well, let's stick with fuels. We've mentioned fuels being bad. Um, since 2020, there's been a low sulfur marine fuel oil. Um, there's still a lot more sulfur in marine fuel than we're allowed to have in diesel engines on the land, but it's got a lot better. Went from 3.5% to 0.5% in January 2020. Um, nothing to do with COVID. A total coincidence. Um, people are planning to use hydrogen to transport things or even liquid ammonia. So putting a whole bucket of poisonous stuff on a ship uh, to drive it around the place. Of course, liquid natural gas is regarded as being less toxic than um diesel fuel or as a, a heavy fuel oil. There's also attempt at doing biofuels and green LNG. Another thing that people want to do is just make everything more efficient. So for instance, if you just drive your ship slower or drive slower in general, you save a lot of uh, fuel costs. People are putting bubbles, so they've got their vehicles that are traveling on uh, layers of bubbles. And what's called weather routing, where people actually aim their boats to um, not have to fight into the weather quite as much. There's a lot of interest in developing battery systems in the same way that the Tesla now has a, a pickup truck. Um, there's an uh, idea here that we could uh, do battery powered shipping. Uh, so lots, lots of trucks out there. Trains are, of course, are often electric. Uh, this ship that you can see here has a whole bunch of batteries. The green containers towards the stern of the boat are actual giant batteries. The plan with Fleet Zero is that they will take the batteries off um, in a harbour, put freshly loaded batteries on there, and the ship will be able to carry on without any nasty greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, clean uh, battery power comes from wind turbines. Wind turbines, you turn the... You do a whole bunch of things. Why don't we just use the wind where it is out in the ocean to propel ourselves around the place? So it does sail cargo actually exist in the 21st century? Well, it's still used in a lot of places. Here's an image of a uh, sailing Parisi in Indonesia. It's used in the Caribbean. It's used in Tanzania, for instance. Um, European sail transport closed down in 2001. Uh, the sh last ship operating in the Baltic stopped working. And then at the same time, a couple of crazy uh, Dutchmen and an Austrian built the Pierius Magnus in the USA and sailed across the Atlantic to try and create clean cargo. But it was all a bit of a pipe dream until things actually started happening about 10 years later. I'll just do a quick introduction to a couple of things that exist. 
because it really feels like nonsense to be putting a, a whole bunch of stuff on sailing ships to sail around in the 21st century. Uh, the Tree Hombres is probably the ship that, if you start looking at these things, we saw the fair transport mentioned earlier. Um, it's a ship that has no motor, so it can't use a motor ever. It can't use that as a backup. Uh, it started traveling in 2010, delivering aid to Haiti, and then brought back some dreadful cheap rum, which tasted remarkably better when it got back to Europe. Um, it's a very traditional boat. It looks like it belongs in a pirate movie, and it's taken up doing what we call the North Atlantic cycle, where it basically heads at the uh, end of the cycle in the hurricane season in the Caribbean. It heads over on the trade winds to the Caribbean, picks up a bunch of things there, and brings them back via the Azores to to Europe. Um, very important. Uh, the Aventura does a very similar sort of route. Um, it's developed by the German Kunis Bockmann based on seeing how destroyed the Great Barrier Reef here in Australia was. It's also a 1920s boat, it's now 100 years old. It's now coming up for Voyage 11. I apologize, Voyage 10 was on its way when I made this. Um, and it was planned originally for Southeast Asia and the Pacific, but actually just uh, does this sort of North Atlantic cycle as well. So this is the Voyage uh, 10 and Voyage 11 is coming up right now. I think they're leaving in a couple of weeks. Um, takes a whole bunch of things, a couple of things over to the Caribbean, brings back a lot of cocoa, uh, chocolate and rum. Um, it's not all just decadence. Here is the Kwai, which operated until recently out of Hawaii. Um, it was sail driven for economical reasons. Um, it was fuel is expensive. They could run down to the islands in the Pacific from the Hawaii to the Cook Islands and around a various a route there, pick up a whole bunch of things, deliver things, um, and operate quite well. Recently, they started doing ocean plastic removal. They actually go out and dig up a whole bunch of bits of floating plastic from the North Pacific Gyre. And in 2020, it was sold to the Marshall Islands as part of their uh, infrastructure. So they'll have sail freight in the Marshall Islands. Um, for those of you who are more francophone and like modern things, this is a brand new spanking flashy boat. Looks very modern, um, delivers very high end things across the Atlantic, uh, wines and chocolates mostly from uh, France to New York City. Picks up a bunch of aid, which it takes to Haiti and then comes back with raw products for chocolate. So triangular route to North Atlantic, different from the one that's used by some of the other vessels. Um, it's doing really well they're making loads of money out of it and it just works and they're building a new ship that's going to be basically twice as large 52 meters long 350 tons of of chocolate and you've got other beautiful boats like this one the vega which was basically a bunch of adventurers traveling around 2004 in the tsunami in the indonesian archipelago they were asked to deliver a bunch of tsunami uh, relief and they did and they just kept on doing it so for the past 15 almost 20 years they've been taking medical gear, educational gear, and other stuff down to the Indonesian archipelago from Singapore and other places. Um, and it's a lovely uh, project and they're doing a lot of great interaction with the local communities on islands that are very isolated there. Um, and just so the Americans don't feel like we're ignoring them, uh, the Apollonia has been running up and down the Hudson for a few years. They deliver uh, things to breweries and grains and a bunch of nonsense. Um, up and down the Hudson. There's actually been a couple of interesting projects are in, in the northeast and the northwest of the US. There was a floating uh, farmer stall um, in the northwest for a while. And in 2013, the Vermont Sale Project basically brought a bunch of uh, Vermont products down the Hudson River in a purpose-built barge um, and was selling them. They weren't able to maintain that as an ongoing project. Similarly, the artist Severin, um, Florentine Severin, came and did a project called the main cell freight, freight project, uh, mail cell freight, main cell freight project as a pageant, as a performance. Um, we see lots of variations in the way things are done. Um, there's like ways of going about doing this. This is probably not something that's relevant now. We can come back to it. Different ways that people manage to make this work because it's working. People are actually running companies on. They're not getting rich, but they're at least not learning money. What are they actually carrying? Most of the things are extremely valuable, small things like coffee beans, about rum tequilas, rums and tequilas, uh, wines, olive oil, coastal EU transport, finished chocolate, as well as cocoa beans, cacao beans, um, and they're carrying aid and they are doing some general cargo. So this is this thing they transport is about things that need to be transported um, and transporting things that are small and valuable and improve lives like spices and tea and coffee is probably the thing that we should be transporting and not uh, huge amounts of cars and some other nonsense. There's a bunch of projects going on that are emerging. Uh, Chiba is being built in the island and the um, 
Costa Rica and Central America. It will have electric motors. It's a very traditional design out of wood. They have planted more trees than they cut down for this, uh, this ship. And it should be on the water in 2025. They have a ship that's going on the water this year that'll be running coffee from Colombia up to New York City. Uh, lovely boat, lovely people. And Tout in France, who've been operating out of um, Tournay, have uh, finally managed to raise the money to build this ridiculously large uh, sail freighter to be able to bring things across the Atlantic. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this works out. They've been building this network and their, their entire network for probably about 10 years now and are doing amazing stuff. So they've managed to pull this off. So this is like an emerging thing. It's growing, it's actually becoming industrial. You can see this is not like a bunch of like crazy people rebuilding a boat like with the Trey Hombras, the smell of tar and that sort of old salty thing. This is remarkably boring infrastructure. It's built with steel and it's gonna work really well. Um, some people like the Eco Clipper have emerged from Trey Hom the Trey Hombras from the Fair Transport people and are now planning to be doing this around the world network. You might notice that the places where it stops are a little bit arbitrary. Um, in Australia, they seem to be aiming for the Kimberley where there is nothing. Um, and they're not visiting you in Kerala, which I'm very upset by. They should be actually have a stop in Kochi to come and see you in their planned um, adventures. We'll see what actually emerges there. There's a bunch of other people doing interesting things like the International Windship Association, they're lobbyists doing interesting stuff. What's maybe more interesting is the Sail Cargo Alliance, which is like a bottom up network of people doing this sort of stuff. They have these annual exchange meetings, they do a lot of uh, exchanging ideas, and they have a very strong ethical basis. And for instance, they've got this uh, mission statement that they put together a few years ago, which is all about um, the important ethical things that you can do in the with sail cargo. They want to have connections happening. They want to have like honest, balanced relationships, non-extractivist. And I really enjoyed the way that this resonates strongly with um, the talk yesterday from the Laboratory of Arts and Aesthetics, where they were talking about um, non-extractivist ethics and trans-local alliance building. Um, something that was talked about yesterday. Really cool stuff and the SCA is very much like this they have actually have a complete ethical system they've built up one of the interesting things is a lot of the people in the sail cargo alliance you discover when you scratch the surface are actually permaculturalists so they've had their fingers in the soil um, and that's this is the sort of thing that they're doing next to be able to bring good food to good people uh, our work is all around imagining possible futures so here's an imagination uh, and making that physically experienceable i won't try and talk about that at length um, we do a lot of futuring exercises talk about ocean health another very interesting group is the hudson river maritime museum based in there they have a conference they had a conference this year they'll do it again in two years um, on uh, inland and coastal sail freight and they brought out something called the sail cargo freight manual like Basically, you could pick up this book and you would learn a lot about how to set up your own system. Um, and there are people around the world who are setting up small local systems. There might be something relevant for what you're doing there. So what's happening in the Indian Ocean? One of the things that we've noticed um, for sail freight that makes sense is there's no point transporting things between places where the same things grow. There's like, and they basically are east-west lines like the guns german steel idea that along an east west line things tend to look the same here we have a diagram of bioregions um, around the indian ocean but it's a global map and you can see that most of them have quite an extensive east west um, connection so along those lines the same things grow so there's not much point actually transporting stuff along those lines because it's the same stuff available locally or transported what's interesting is transporting things north south so for instance uh olive oil and port and wines from portugal to the uk very short or from the caribbean to europe or from uh the tea growing regions of the azores into europe um so this north south like trans bioregional uh transport is really important um, we were having a bit of a meeting last week, coincidentally, and a bunch of people who were doing production and, and imports in the southwest of Western Australia here on Noongabuja. This is the Aboriginal name for this region. Uh, Wadandi is the very local tribe, the saltwater people. Um, we brought a bunch of experts from commodities and maritime uh, trades to brainstorm around what would it mean to be here on the Indian Ocean and doing uh, ideas about sail transport here, what would actually make sense. And we developed four images of what would be possible, um, four imaginations, four visions, uh, which were a lot of fun. The one that's probably most interesting that we can see here is essentially this idea of the Indian Ocean as being a place where a lot of interesting things happen. We've got 
coffees um, in Tanzania and East Africa. We've got chocolates and vanilla from Madagascar. We've got all the wonderful teas and spices in uh, Kerala and other regions of India, um, up above Calcutta as well, Darjeeling. We've got all the teas in China, of course, and, and the spice islands in the archipelago of Indonesia. Uh, cloves and pepper coming out of Malaysia and Vietnam's got a whole bunch of other interesting spices. And there are trade winds. So we saw a diagram earlier that talked about the currents in the various oceans. And there is basically a trade wind current that goes anti-clockwise around the Indian Ocean. And the one of the maritime experts said that by the time you've got from Indonesia across to Sri Lanka and, and southern India, there is no point trying to sail back to Australia directly. You can't do it. You're fighting headwinds. So you might as well go over to Africa, down to Madagascar, come along the, the south end of the Indian Ocean across the back bottom of the planet, back to WA. And this would be something that would be like an Indian Ocean route. And this ties in really nicely with the tradition where we know that in addition to the Silk Road that went across the plateau of Tibet between China or the, the Far East and into Europe, the coastal regions of India operated as a sail cargo net network for a very long time. In fact, there is evidence to suggest that at the end of the last ice age, around 7,000 years ago, the west coast of uh, India emerged as a trading nexus and it stayed that way until around 800 AD. I'm not sure what happened at that time to stop that from happening, uh, but all the way along that, that coast. And they basically were trading with all the empires as they came and went. It was the Babylonian, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans. It was all going through this, this Indian nexus. And there is no reason why that shouldn't happen. I think Muziris is the one of the subtitles of the Kochi festival. And I think this is really interesting that Muziris sort of exists as this mythical place where this all uh, happened from. And perhaps in some near future speculation, we could sort of put together on here, what would it actually mean for this nexus to re-emerge? What would that mean for the, the local producers in um, that area? And what would they want to get? And what would they want to be passing on? What are their gives and their gets, um, their, their wants and their needs uh, as part of a Indian Ocean regional trading network that would bring the valuable things around? So we've been doing a bit of speculation around that. And that's something that I would like to continue as we go into the near future. Thank you for your attention. I hope we've got a bit of time to have a bit of a chat about some of these things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Fascinating. It makes me want to board one of those ships. <laughs> yeah. the ground to sail because they kind of from my own town. So I, I could see the boat, uh, but never really had a chance to I don't know, cross the Atlantic with him. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe the, is, is Rob and Gabriel still around? Suresh, maybe you could join uh, the table. We have kind of last few questions. We're a bit late on time, I know, but uh, five minutes and there's a performance starting soon, but we could take a few questions from the audience if anyone want to come up with a question to team or to our previous speakers. Anyone? Yep. No, I... I have a quick question, maybe, um, just on the back of Tim's talk. Um, um, I was just wondering um, what might be for, for, these, for, these, for all these projects and, and people looking to, to act together, what might be the balance between the economics, influencing the economics and influencing maybe policy? That's a really interesting point. There's... Um... Uh, a book that just come out. Oh, if I was better planned, I'd actually have my copy of it because it just arrived like two days ago um, about a uh, cultural anthropist and does a lot of policy work, Christian de Boekela, based in the University of Melbourne. And in 2020, as a experiment and find out, okay, what does this sail trade thing mean? He joined the Aventur, the German boat that I mentioned, to cross the Atlantic from Hamburg or even some in the Carib in the Canaries to the Caribbean, where he was then going to go and visit Chiba, where they're building the boat in Costa Rica, and then go back and probably write a... Um, a paper about it or or be accused of having a rort and just having a holiday um COVID happened as we know and he got stuck on the boat for five or six months and he's brought a book out about what happened then both like a travelogue of that that what that story what happened to him but also about the depth of experience that he gained in what's going on there and he's developed a lot of policy ideas that i could try and explain but he can do it much better than i can 
And there are a number of, um, a couple of papers that he's brought out in the meantime where he talks about that. So there is this idea of like developing policy. And so the IWSA, the International Windship Association, is doing a lot of that. So they want to make things change. There's organizations like uh, Transport and Ecology, and there's a couple of other ones. Lucy Gilliam is very active there um, in making a lot of this stuff happen. Um, that sort of match really nicely by all these bottom up people. They're just trying it because what's happening with the IWSA is they can't show evidence that this actually works financially or not much. Um, so people like Green to Sale who've gone beyond this sort of romantic, uh, like foundational thing, um, where they were making their money as basically a three way split of training people showing up at, um, sale conferences and people would then, they'd host people and they'd basically pay a lot of money for someone to have a, an event on their, on their ships and actually sailing cargo. That was sort of their three, what their three way poly income. Grain to sale is just transporting high quality goods from their own production across to New York City where they're selling it for a huge amount of money. They're donating time and effort to transport aids to Haiti and the Dominican Republic and then coming back with their own product. Um, so they've managed to sort of push up from this radical like fair transport people into an actual working business as a tout and a few other people. And then the IWSA is trying to make things happen there where they're looking a lot at efficiencies, where they're putting, putting Fletner rotors on cargo ships, giant cargo ships, so that they can now in Australia, they're just celebrating the fact that they're going to be saving 5% of the fuel on the ships that are exporting huge amounts of coal from Australia, from Newcastle, which is a little bit pointless, saving 5% of the fuel in order to export a whole bunch of fuel of uh, coal. That's just like what we shouldn't be doing anyway. Just seems a little bit of um, trying really hard to shoot yourself in the foot. So there's a bunch of things that are going on at multiple levels. Um, the likelihood that we're going to see giant uh, clipper ships um, transporting huge amounts of wares around the, the ocean soon is, is unlikely. That said, uh, Dijkstra, who developed the Maltese Falcon, a uh, very glamorous sailing ship for someone who was stupidly rich, um, have developed a eco liner, like a sailing cargo ship. Um, and they reckon that for $20 million, they can build it. And this can be a moderately sized, purely wind driven, low crew requirements uh, transport um, that would be actually viable and be able to be built relatively quickly. So let's see what's happening um, in the next next little while. Does that sort of meet that sort yeah. of match? Yeah. That sort of, is this smorgasbord of things going up? And there's, there are some people doing like arts based work, culture, uh, creative work in there. And there's a lot of like little injections, um, where people are doing interesting things that are somewhat left of center, um, uh, which is quite interesting. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Ustam. This question is for Suresh. Suresh, you talk about uh, that farming is not just an extension of your work as an artist, but that it is your practice. Can you help us appreciate that more? Should I elaborate more? or <laughs> No, just help us appreciate that more. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, because I've been talking to uh, uh, at many levels, you know, from uh, if I'm talking to my neighbors in the farm, I would not say it's an art project or something. My aunt doesn't care whether I'm a professor or a university or whatever it is, you know. She sees me, I'm a tenant in a farm, you know. So there are many levels uh, that I've been handling such questions, you know, things like that. So if I talk to a kid, it's a very different level. I have to get down and talk to about the growing and things like that. As soon as I go from here next week, this whole week is packed with the primary tiny kids who would walk to the farm. So I have to humble down and get into that scale of perspective and talk. So today we are in a flat farm and mostly this post lockdown, I'm been uh, uh, coming onto such uh, art platforms and things like that and talking about my projects. So people ask me that my very good friends in Bangalore that uh, Suresh, you not just stretch the border, but you cross the border. And but uh, what I feel is every time I've been doing such projects in the past, I mean, nothing to do with food, but with other aspects of community, you know, more or less, either it could be art, uh, art in community or performance arts in public, or uh, something like the transport uh, thing we did, or uh, something what we called our space uh, 
uh, as a studio or the city as studio and things like that. Uh, we always ask this question that are you an organizer or your manager or you're an artist? So I, I always felt that only time will tell. And I feel today this this whole idea of Mina or Sisti uh, inviting me to this context today is itself is like kind of an answer to this very uh, questions we raise about the such practices. And, uh, and also we as a collective in Bangalore, as a group of artists, we did as work as activists, uh, like whether it's about saving this Venkata Art Gallery and uh, doing something there or uh, when we raise some funds to help artists who were during the lockdown and things like that, you know. So uh, I don't see that that is it's beyond a community thing. So uh, fortunately, this community where I'm working is I'm uh, I'm alien in the sense because I'm educated. Uh, otherwise, I belong to this very same soil I'm working about. So this question of soil is always means for me the community. And when I step out of this village to deliver things, I see my cousins, I see my aunts, I see my uncles around waving around or uh, saying hello to me or you know things like that. So for me, this whole idea of working uh, to the community means I'm always working there in in very geographical situation also. So and unfortunately, the city has grown. Uh, there's a university there. There's so many international schools around the farm and the same villagers. And my cousins, uh, kids study in this very fancy schools. If they don't visit my farm, my cousins and families don't visit my farm, but children are brought to the farm through their schools. So there's uh, some kind of a validation happening to that level. So I'm so proud of it in a sense that, yeah, this is what actually maybe ideally I wish to. So maybe... Like as my first wish, maybe Sristi, for example, uh, schools like that or alternative schools like this, maybe we should think uh, the way we think about weaving and with the way we think about pottery in our foundations, we should think about gardening and food, talk about food, uh, or cook food, literally cook food as art practice. So that should solve a lot of our questions like that. <laughs> I think we have to, I have a sign that we have to close. I, I still had the last question for the team. I want, you didn't mention much about your own project, but how, do, how does your research translate in your art, art practice team? Uh, I think about the Turnton Docklands project, for instance. How, how do you uh, translate that? Um, that's a question that, of course, can lead to a 17 hour presentation where I go and talk about all sorts of things. Uh, and the work that we do is about creating experiences of possible futures. And a lot of our work is around oceans and ocean health and things. So by creating the, in the feeling that you're walking into a space where sail cargo is a normal thing, because that is a clean way of doing transport, where moving around and getting from Australia to Europe would mean working on working your passage on a ship or being a passenger on a ship and the times that will take or an airship perhaps perhaps there are zeppelins who like reintroduce themselves so we involve those that research into the worlds that we develop so that when you pick up the turnton gazette a newspaper from the future um it is talking about the things that are happening in the shipping world and like d uh, invisibilizing that whole infrastructure of shipping as part of what people are reading about in the future on an everyday basis. So by creating a newspaper, we can like talk about all these concepts and bring them to real life. Another thing that we've done is something a bit like the uh, feral trade work that Kate Rich does and the experiments in business, where we've gone and actually created like micro pilots of, of like what would it mean to be transporting vegetables along the Danube, like into the city, like and working out how that could work and running it. And then it ran into a, a brick wall. There were issues that were insurmountable. But doing that sort of thing as a art project, I think this is really interesting what Suresh was talking about. As an artist, but a farmer as well, there is possibly this overlap where you can do farming as an art practice in the same way that we can we could look at doing performances of, of delivery and transport as an arts practice in the same way that uh, Kate Rich with Federal Trade is doing these sort of performances of uh, trading and running a grocery store as an arts practice. It doesn't need to make money, but it still has to make sense. And that's a really nice sort of thing to bring together, to be thinking about how can we make these things make sense on an ethical level, on a way that actually feeds itself, 
And I think once again, uh, I mentioned very briefly the permaculture uh, principles. They can help in, inspire these things because, as you say, Gabriel, these things have to pay their own way. Like they have to sort of be financially viable, but there's also a whole bunch of policy. And there are other things that are valuable. They're not just about making money. They're also about making sense. Um, that was a bit of a roundabout way of talking about it, but there's lots of ways that this sort of feeds into our ongoing uh, sort of artistic and cultural practice. Thank you for the question. You, you came with that conclusion. Uh, kind of give a good conclusion for this panel. Um, <laughs> thank you. <everybody. laughs> so thank you very much, Gabriel, Tim, Rob, Suresh, for can I contributing. Just, can I just say something? Thank you all. I just wanted to say Mosris is not a myth. It is an archaeological site in Kerala, in your, near Cochin. So when you mm. come next, you will have Mosris here. But before we close to this session, some of my colleagues who have been walk working very silently behind the scene will be leaving at six. Meghna, can you please stand up? Yeah. She's a textile crafts and a product designer and a faculty at Srishti leads the program. And we have Benjamin. Where's Benji? He's the head of the technical team. He was here managing all this. And we also had Amitabh who left in the morning, who was the mover and shaker, putting everything together. Sorry. Santosh. Santosh came with Benji. He supports our technical support staff. And we, of course, have Rustam and Ramesh here. Ramesh is the associate director. He'll be here for next two days. But thank you all. Thank you really so much for handling this so smoothly. Thank you. We have to go back to and the drums. So now we invite you for a chit chat, uh, action performance outside, like um, initiated by Kaskolang with 60 students of the Interim Festival of IDs. Uh, Kaskolang are initiated, is a project, are initiated by Fiona Debel and Roel Schoenmakers and executed by multidisciplinary team of creatives. They are aimed at the development of an ecological and social sustainable society locally and globally. Class Colon have worked internationally and in the Netherlands, South Africa, Brazil, Peru, Mexico, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Palestine, Egypt, Japan, and they are even going to be um, in Tamil Nadu in June, July for the International uh, Tropical Biology Conference. If you're around, you should join them this summer. See you outside and the next panel start uh, now with a bit of maybe delay, let's say 520, 5.30 um, here on uh, living communities and living projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, Tim, Gabriel. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Bye. Nice to see you all. Wish I was there. <laughs> Get a sailboat. Yep. <laughs> so you and thank you. Can you hear the music? The music. A lot of percussions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ciao, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joel. Talk soon. Bye bye. Maya, Mindy, for organizing this panel uh, as one of the curators. And our first presenter is uh, Asta Chauhan, uh, whom I've known for a while. Asta Chauhan is an artist and curator known for her public art and community engagement projects in New Delhi, particularly in the urban villages of Kirki. She's currently teaching curating public community art projects at Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology, one of the co-hosts of this uh, assembly. She's a board member of the Hen Valvani community radio station, and she'll talk about that. A project started as a youth initiative in 2001 in the Himalayan district of Chamba, Uttarakhand, an area which some of you may know is home to historical feminist environmental movements such as the Jipko movement, which is the first mother of all environmental movements in independent India, the tree huggers and the beach Pachawa Andolan, save the organic seed, which goes on till this day. So, Maya. Uh, sorry, Asta. <laughs> okay, um, recording in progress. We have the slide on.
full screen please all right um so it's a long story um and i'm going to start with the genesis um i got interested in community radio um in 2006 when i was there in nepal for a workshop and i interviewed the uh, tourist guides from um, the area that we were working in and the program got edited and broadcast on a local community radio station where why is my slide not moving yeah um and then on the day the exhibition opened i had given small radio sets to all the people who worked with me and we listened to the radio program as it was broadcast uh in 2007 i started to actually follow the community radio forums in india and i met rajender negi who then becomes a partner and um i'll tell you more about why i continued to work with radio thanks to him uh in 2007 the community radio in india was still finding its ground in policy and finding ways uh, there were lots of activists involved in trying to make it more accessible and to make the legal process of applying for a radio station slightly easier um and then i got another grant where i was still really happy about working with radio so i interviewed uh local residents in delhi in kirki where i was at the time uh, about just home remedies and i built my own little radio station in 2009 that's the transmitter uh the wiper that you see was my uh the antenna with which i could broadcast it wasn't very very stable uh also extremely illegal to use fm frequency but artists so yeah so that i broadcast the program for about 2 days and um, then i went in 2011 to uh the michelangelo pistoletto foundation again in found a extremely uh, interesting gentleman um who had his own radio station and built his own cathode ray transmitter so i'm i'm in this head space of just finding radio fascinating because community radio has a two way communication system right it's a small radius so people can call in and you actually have a way of functioning in a communicative space it's not one person barking at you all the time uh the program that i did of uh, i made interviews with this gentleman which was broadcast on a community radio in in, in turin um and back to chamba so in 2010 uh, i got a grant from uh, khoj and i traveled to uttarakhand the gentleman's photo i showed you i followed him to uttarakhand where his uh, not for profit organization and youth organization were working they started in 2001 setting up uh, the groundwork for a community radio station the area that you're looking at is also home to some of the big uh, uh, you know yatras the sites for pilgrimage and uh, and it's also close to the china border so the area has many complex issues of its own we'll get into that later so this is the himalayan region of chamba in uttarakhand they practice a lot of uh, organic farming even now and uh, the villages are scattered so on top of the hill, you have two houses one on the base of the hill and one on top and you farm according to season either on the top or at the bottom and uh, a lot of the villages actually don't have road and electricity yet so you use donkeys to carry your water from the river this is a small village of chamba where on the second floor of a tiny building is the radio station um hevalwani heval is the name of the river where this area is and the hevalwani literally translates to the voice of the river uh they have a very very modest setup using egg trays to actually uh, soundproof the studio so really basic in that sense uh mostly run by women which is fabulous and we'll talk about how gendered uh actually this idea of land inheritance and carrying on a certain legacy forward can be having said that rp that's in the previous slide uh the young girl at the microphone is rp uh, who's a very dear friend and a partner and a key reporter at the radio station uh what i did in 2010 was to continue this thing of recording and interviewing people this region is rich in medicinal plants so to uh, interview and find out about home remedies again and uh, yeah, yeah this lady for instance is uh, gets possessed by the mount mountain goddess and she spoke about how everything this is in 2010 everything that's going on right now is going to lead to complete destruction and she wasn't wrong and the region is now um 
has forest fires, landslides, uh, and more recently, the land has started to sink. Uh, so these interviews that I did, uh, sorry, these are just shots of the radio station. It's quite lovely, actually. Everyone gets their food, which they have grown in their farms. They're all farmers. They've grown this food in their farms. They've cooked it. They come and they share it. So this, uh, we broadcast, the radio station broadcasts to um, about 700 villages. That's 300,000 listeners in the region. So that's quite substantial. And a lot of the volunteers who come and join also come from the region. And hence, a variety of the dicot dicotyledonous seeds and food actually come to the radio station table. At the beginning of the harvest or the end of the harvest, the beginning of the season, uh, farmers will come and leave sacks of walnuts or potatoes or whatever they're growing at the radio station as well. So I think it's nice because we are also, the radio station is also the connection between um, the politicians, the MLAs, the police and the local administration to work. So the radio station is kind of owned by the villagers, you know. So after all the interviews about home remedies, what I just sort of found out is everyone is so involved in watching television and consumed by advertisements. And that no matter how much I tried, the way Shah Rukh Khan can sell a toothpaste, I cannot sell the idea of home remedy. So I edited my audio into um, short advertisements that uh, were used. So basically, if you brush your teeth with walnut leaves, it's supposed to be as good as pepsid and toothpaste. But in order to convince the younger people to start doing that, I uh, work with the team to generate these short advertisements that are broadcast on the radio station in between their programming. So that was the first sort of project. Uh, the advertisements are available online. We don't have enough time. Otherwise, I would have loved to play some of my audios for you. Later, I got the project to Delhi where uh, many years later, actually. And we had a discussion around what, how do we take this idea of local seeds and local knowledge back into a system of conversation, right? Um, yeah, so Ravi had mentioned um, quickly about the region. The region is home to the tree huggers of the Chipko Andolan, which was a feminist um, movement, eco movement, where people uh, from a particular village stood between authority and the tree and reclaimed the way of of you know owning the forest. What this step then later resulted in many policy level changes that happened to the way forests are treated in the region. Right. And then the anti Tiri movement. Tiri Dam is one of the largest dams. I think it drowned more than 400 villages. Um, and big dams, as we all know, can be more destructive than anything else. Uh, so the, this, they also had the anti Tiri Dam movement. These are images of the villages after the dam was built. This is in the 80s. Um, and the Save the Seed movement, uh, which was started by Vijay Jadhari and Sudesh Naji, again in the 80s. So these are all three very important movements of the region. And the team I work with are all people who belong to either the family of the activists who started the movement or were in some way or the other involved in these protests and movements. Uh, a lot of the farming, like I said, is organic. So they don't have tillers and, and uh, mechanized things. They, we still use bulls in the region. and. Uh, these are images from one of the uh, festivals we had. So the Save the Seed movement, the Beat Bachao Andolan, regularly has these meetings to bring in the farmers to remind them uh, that we must keep a fistful of the original seed with us. And the thing is that, I mean, what they perpetuate is also that our children can starve and die, but that one fist of original seed must be kept. So every year we have a variety of millets and so these seeds are put out villagers also get their own to contribute um, and it becomes a nice way to actually communicate meet and talk about this um, we have had a lot of difficulty in the past because uh, no matter how much we call the agriculture minister for meetings what he comes to do and tell us is to give us subsidies on tillers instead of actually helping us find ways to sustain this kind of farming it is still like i said relevant and prevalent in a lot of these villages. Uh, so that is the tent and we call the agriculture minister um, who I don't think heard what we had to say and addressed any of the issues. He still continued to try and sell us German made tillers. I'm, I'm very confused why he did that. Um, yeah, uh, women form the spine of this agrarian society and uh, they uh, even at the radio station. So they go perform as farmers in the morning pack their lunch, reach the radio station, broadcast, and then from there they go to other villages to collect content. And that's how it works. So 
I'm, uh, want to quickly talk about how the how it started. So in 2001, it starts as a youth movement. I met them only in 2010, so it's uh, I joined them much later. Uh, when I met them, they were just doing narrow casting at the time. Narrow casting is that you take a record and you go village to village to collect content, edit it, and then take it back to the village to play it at the panchayat or at the assembly hall of the village. Uh, so these records on CDs, we would carry them from one place to the other. And then after we play it, we ask the villagers what is it that they want to find out. The content could be anything from I'm having issues with the... Um, monkeys raiding my village and how do I deal with that or is there any other farmer who's growing this kind of tomato this season and have you found a solution for this new pest that has come and there's a con constant conflict between the forest and the and the agrarian society here of course so these are all things that kind of come into circulation one of the reasons that the radio station started was also because Garwali is the language of the region um, had almost gone extinct. No, nobody was speaking it anymore. And the radio station only broadcasts in the, the Garwali language, which kind of got the language back into the fore. And the second most important thing where the radio station started was to stop urban migration. And to, because the land is rich and uh, there's no abject poverty in the region. The soil is rich. It's the Gangetic Plains. It's everything is works. But it's the, you know, Sometimes it's the schools are not good enough or the jobs are not good enough or it's social, the desire for social upward mobility or the fact that, yes, my farm can take care of what I need to eat, but it can't buy me the smart smartphone from which I find so much of pleasure now. So uh, for various reasons, urban migration has been a big problem of the hills. It only kind of stopped or reversed during COVID, but we'll get into that a little later. So yeah, listening sessions in the house of the houses of the leaders of the village, etc. Uh, till 2012, 13, our mobile phones also had a way to uh, receive FM frequency and we could listen to radio on our phone, which is no longer the case. But at that time, it became really good because once we got the license, we were able to, uh, you know, everybody could be working in their farms and just put their mobile phone and listen to the radio live. Some of the villages, like I said, are cut off from the mainland and you have to trek kilometers to get there because there's no road or infrastructure that has gotten there yet. But because they are in the region that we broadcast, we trek because we want to share the stories over there as well as collect theirs. Um, on top of the houses, you can see there are a few solar panels and the panels are used to power three light bulbs and one radio set. And that radio set is what is how they understand what's happening, whether there's a forest fire or there's any, uh, I mean, this is a, we have won many awards for disaster management because when roads break or floods happen, the radio is the only mode of communication with the other villagers to warn them or inform them. So, yeah, interestingly, then the houses have power enough to listen to the radio and contribute. Um, we, uh, at one point, the river started to dry out and we organized this walk along the river to 40 villages. And we spoke to each village about why is the, re and, and there were very many different, different reasons. There were bottlenecks, there was plastic ac accumulation, there was some uh, road that had come in the way. So 40 villages we walked through and we collected stories. Um, this also yeah, kind of, it also becomes a two-way thing, right? The more people we meet, the more listeners we have, which is why we have 300,000 listeners, because we actually go literally village to village and it's not door to door. Some of these treks, I actually stood in the middle of the mountain and cried because I've never walked that much in my life. But um, Yeah, so that was the Havel story. Our current struggles, um, I, this is a nice slide. We have, we begin most of our meetings with poetry recitation. So everyone decides original poem before we start. Uh, and on this is a new year meeting that we had where we were trying to take, get a sense of how do we uh, deal with the current crisis. One of which is forest fires, which should be starting about now. The dry season ends in forest fires, forest fires that are terrible for the birds and the animals and the critters and the and all other life form in the forest. It's very hard to control. Uh, all Literally all villagers get, have to get involved, but we are trying to find ways to also, because this is now happening every year, so we have to f train the younger, more able body to be able to deal with the forest fires as well. Um, more recently, land has started to sink in this area, and that is due to highway expansion projects, big dams, um, of course, climate change as well. So a lot of the glaciers are melting and flooding the region. There are flash floods, there are cloud bursts. Uh, uh, we don't have summer, winter. We literally have crisis to crisis, and that's our season. Fires, floods, rains, drought. Uh, 
these are some photographs i've taken this is the char dham yatra for in, those who are familiar with it the highway project that is the pet of our current government and they refuse to acknowledge that it is actually terrible because the more they widen the road as of now they, it's called an all season road it's all season for maybe one scooter that can a two wheeler that can go up and down but the rest of it is in terrible condition and the more you eat into it the more it slides down himalayas are a young mountain they literally it's mud and spit put together in the form of a mountain so it crumbles really easily and everything that held it was roots of trees and the the massacre of trees starts way earlier when the the first trains of india were made the benches of the were made from forests from this very region um an epic story of the king of harsil which we can get into later um post covid and future pedagogy so covid uh, at the radio station was a time of chaos because a lot of misinformation was floating around so we had to do a lot of fire fighting from getting calls like i've heard if i have 17 glasses of cow milk the fever will break or if i eat a certain thing then i wouldn't get covid so we a lot of management of information started to happen during covid what we also realized is that education went online and a lot of the village children don't have smartphones which meant that they had no education for those months on end of lockdown so the radio station doubled up to also start to do these small sort of classes whether it was history geography and we tried to make it relevant uh, to the region our new syllabus no longer talks about the the tree huggers movement or the save the seed movement so we thought it's a good time to actually reintroduce that to the children of the valley at least from where this starts um that's um there are small government schools in the region plenty of them uh, but children hesitate to go a lot of parents would prefer to send their children to a english medium school or a non government school like i said whether it's social upward mobility or the desire for the child to progress in life in the post industrial way that we look at education um but we do get the kids to come and also take charge of the radio station so we teach recording and interviewing and editing so that they also become the next generation to run the station and take ownership of it um so that's rajender and i kind of put our heads together and we for the future we're planning um jeevan shala which is a concept rajender is more interested in actually uh going back to the old system of farming we still have a lot of the villages are empty i told you that we have urban migration so now we have ghost town upon ghost village upon ghost village and several of the owners have approached us at the radio station to say take my house and start a school so that we don't have to just send our children to other cities um rajender wants to turn this into a sort of a living museum where you can come at any time of the year and learn how to farm and learn the ways of um uh, the ways of the farmer of the uttarakhand region from a long time ago i have my reservations about that uh, because i feel like this sort of nostalgia means that uh, um minorities and women will be treated exactly like the, the like the way they were in the nostalgic past and a lot of this inheritance is actually a very uh, the space of the man aarti runs the radio station she's a cook she uh, she does she's a journalist she does all of that um but she doesn't have the land in her name legally the farm or the land or the inheritance of whether it's land or the related information data knowledge rests with the man and so i sometimes arti and i we um, we worry that this agenda of trying to go back to the roots and go back to the old school way of farming uh, has no place for the woman because actually women find it easier to be in cities because they can be away from the gaze and and be themselves so the the modernity that cities offers actually very nice for the people on the margins having said that this is jeevan shala that has come together with a lot of these ideas that we've argued out and uh, rajender has got us this lonely village where we've got five five six houses from where we're going to start this in may um like i said solar power is already part of our system we and in several of the houses through the radio network we've got subsidies and we are providing electricity back to the grid uh we can continue to i guess find the old ways of living uh, that rajender is offering and th that for instance is the old butter churn which he wants to keep in the new uh, setup of the school uh, that's how you extract sesame seeds so these are all be keeping all the houses have uh, inbuilt space all the houses have inbuilt space for honey bees cows at least three species other species than ours to exist in the house so it's quite wonderful actually 
Um, I'm more interested in, because I teach at Shishti also, I'm more interested in, in the same question of no matter how much we try, uh, the children are going to gravitate towards the bigger cities and the bigger lives and then and moving to to these grand illusions that the cities offer. So how do you change coming back to my first idea of um, how do we how do I make how do I find systems so that the students can see for themselves that perhaps living in the village and continuing that life may be richer during COVID when there was a lockdown and all the labor had to come back we realized that they could contribute to the farming and that year we had seven new species um, not new in the sense they would we had peas but no one was growing them because all the young people have left the village for the city uh, we had excellent crops and a variety of peas and legumes that year and I think that left us with this desire to continue so COVID uh, became an excuse I guess for, uh, for Raju and I to really see now how do we get this to happen because the only time we've been able to see people come back or a reverse migration was due to a pandemic and how does this how do we make this happen without a pandemic i guess um yeah and i'll end with this slide it says uh, um stay away from the monkeys uh, keep your food in your bag uh, don't feed the monkeys and uh, put the garbage in the dustbin and don't use plastic bags thank you Thank you, Asta, for that really exhaustive uh, and your long involvement, a presentation around that. Also, I'd like to thank you for bringing in the idea of distribution of labor and ownership and control of assets, uh, which you, are, you want to contest also as not going back to the same time. <clears throat> uh, before I get to the next speaker, just a question maybe we can answer later which always concerns me. And since you have such a long and sensitive engagement as an outsider to the community, with the community, which you said got together as a youth movement in 2001, you went there in 2010. Uh, and uh, how, what would you, what advice would you give to people who go and intervene in con communities because it's a fraught area of intervention. And, uh, you know, uh, the uh, many disasters have been on good intent. So uh, since you've had an ongoing and you're, you're, you're now continuing your collaboration with that, so maybe we can think about that question later, right? I'd la now like to invite uh, Growing Cultures uh, who are here, Lauren and Rohan, uh, to speak. I'll just introduce them to you. Um, Growing Culture Organization from the US. Uh, they, this is the text that they write about themselves. A growing culture is a radical storytelling organization committed to confronting unjust power in the food system, in the fight for global food sovereignty. Lauren works to shift public perceptions of those who produce the world's food. He believes in farmers having a prominent seat at the table a seat threatened by industrial agriculture. He is a founder and executive director of AGC and has earned recognition for his contributions to ecological agriculture. Rohan is a human, right, human rights activist working as a writer and researcher uh, at Growing Culture. He's passionate about working with radical peasant and worker struggles towards revolutionary praxis. His interests are in contributing to research-led storytelling to challenge dominant narratives and strengthen the case for food sovereignty elsewhere. Um, I'd like them to then take it up. We are looking at two very activist, radical presenters. I look forward to that. Thank you. Guess we're so activists that we have to share the spot. Can't do it alone. So we're going to try to figure out how to both present to you all. Can you guys hear me? Okay.
so agriculture when we think about agriculture what is it that really comes to mind what do you think the purpose of agriculture is because this is where everything started so we dominantly try to think of agriculture as a way to feed people right and we think of it as a way in which we can eliminate world hunger so uh, the dominant narrative around agriculture is centered around food security and food security is essentially the uh, sorry yeah better yeah so basically food security is uh, what we conceptualize agriculture around which is uh, you know guaranteeing everyone accessible uh, the both economic and physical access to food so if we have both economic and physical access to food then we can eliminate world hunger so this is what the narrative suggests so if you look at the world map for hunger this looks like an incredibly massive feat because there's so much hunger everywhere and we have a you know a, a growing population which we need to feed and it's difficult to produce enough food to feed this growing population right now what if we told you that we already produce enough food to feed this entire population we already produce over 1.5 times the world's population or uh, enough food to feed over 1.5 times the world's population enough to feed over a uh, 10 billion people so if we have so much food out there if we have such an abundance then why is it that there's still hunger if you see over time from the 1960s the food production has been increasing steadily at a faster rate than the population growth itself and there's something really uh, messed up about this because the hunger has also been steadily increasing and we haven't come any closer to solving the problem of hunger right over a billion people sleep hungry every night and this got much worse during the pandemic and the sad irony is that most of the people who are hungry are people involved in agriculture themselves they are the people who put food on our tables and they feed us right so somehow this doesn't make sense that the hungry are predominantly people involved in agriculture so let's see who these people are this is a population of 2.5 billion people they plant in small patches of land many of them have tiny patches of land many of them don't even have land they exchange knowledge they exchange seeds and they feed over 70% of the world's population so most of the food that reaches our plate is produced by small holder farmers and they do this on less than 25% of the world's agricultural land and this community sustains the vast majority of the world's agricultural biodiversity and along with indigenous people they produce they sustain most of the world's biodiversity over 80% of the world's biodiversity so they play like a paramount role in preserving diversity in our ecosystem now if you look at this graph this is uh, what we this is how we can compare like our growth in terms of agriculture like over the, over time so here we have different countries here we have india which is comprised primarily of small holder farmers and we see that we have the potential to feed around 6.5 people for every uh, hectare of land that we produce on whereas if you look at us which is primarily large scale agriculture you can see that with all the innovation with all the technology they've pumped in all the billions of dollars that have gone into all this research all the monoculture farms they produce over 2.5 times that much which is uh, for every hectare they can produce enough to feed around 16 people which is great right but then you know this kind of gets skewed when you start looking at how many this is the potential for how many calories are produced right and how many calories actually get delivered to feeding people so this is where it gets a little interesting in india as you can see for every hectare of land we deliver around uh, six uh, enough food to produce to feed around six people right in the us on the other hand that number decreases let me show you again so enough food is produced to feed 16 people but only 5.4 people get fed right so if you look at efficiency in this way what does it really mean if you look at india we are around 90% efficient efficient which means that most of the food that we produce goes into feeding people now where does the remaining food in the us go uh, well only 30% gets delivered to actually you know someone's plate the remaining is diverted so these are large supply chains so one third of the food is lost along the way and this is lost in transit because it has to travel across like a very vast supply chain and the remaining is diverted diverted away from feeding people to feeding the needs of the industry so it is diverted to produce to feeding cattle and other livestock 
it's diverted to uh, biofuels and other consumer products. Most of the food that's produced by the industrial agricultural system is not really dedicated to feeding people. And in India, we're not, uh, well, right now we have this high efficiency, but then what the Indian farmers are protesting right now and have been protesting for the last several years is exactly this, this move away from the purpose of food to produce people to the purpose of food shifting to producing, to feeding the, uh, the industry, right? And that fundamental shift is what farmers are fighting against ultimately. So now what does the industrial food system look like? This is a food system that uses 75% of the agricultural land. The vast majority of all agricultural land is owned by the industrial food system. And they use a massive amount of fossil fuel energy with agrochemicals and all sorts of fertilizers, pesticides to, uh, to, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, to sustain this industry. And they use massive amounts of water and they only feed 30% of the world. So this is the biggest contributor to climate change in the world. And uh, when we look at, when we have conversations about climate change, the industrial food system is the first, uh, is one of the first people to be questioned. I mean, one, one of the first systems that need to be questioned. So what we see is a figure like this, where there is a lot of, uh, you know, consumers on one end and smallholder farmers on the other. And the system, what it does is it creates all these implicit tensions. So where people are made in conflict with each other. So what it does is it puts consumers and producers against each other. Consumers are always fighting for fair prices, right? Or the lowest prices. Producers are just fighting for fair wages or living wages. But then there's no way both of them can win because the majority of the market power is concentrated by a handful of people, by a few retailers, processors, domestic traders, um, a few transnational corporations. So most of the power is consolidated. And... This is what the consolidation looks like right now. Four corporations control the majority of the private seed market. Another four corporations control majority of the global grain trade. Another four corporations control most of the agrochemical market. It's a super consolidated system, right? And we can go back to the map of hunger and Lauren will show you like how it makes sense uh, of the patterns it draws with other, uh, other things we look into. Sorry. Yeah. So what Rohan showed originally was this map of hunger, and we can think of this as just a map of hunger, but it really isn't. When you start to peel away all of those understandings and dimensions of the agricultural food system to get what at the core, you start to see that this map means so much more. So I want you to look at these areas that are that are most uh, you know food insecure, right? And I want you to look at those. And now look at this map. This is a map of biodiversity hotspots around the world. So you can see how the same hotspots of biodiversity are the same spots where people are the most food insecure, right? We can see right there. So now, if you look at biodiversity, and then when you want to understand cultural diversity, the best metric for that is lingual diversity. It's how many languages are spoken, right? Um, India is incredible in this, especially up in the Northeast. But what you see is the linguist diversity is the same spots. Now, how can this be? Because there's no cultural diversity without biological diversity. There's no biological diversity without cultural diversity. They go hand in hand. Why? Because we are nature. We are part of this. The strength of India is the strength of its diversity, both in its people and its biodiversity. Strength of the world is that same story, right? So now when you want to look at the industrialization that comes into this system, take a look at this map. This is the map of international land theft, land grabbing around the world. Look at, does it look familiar? It's the same damn map, right? They're stealing our biological and cultural diversity. They're depriving these communities, pushing them into urban centers, right? This is the industrial agricultural system. And now I'm going to show you a final map, which I hope looks familiar as well, which is climate vulnerability. This is our agricultural system. It is not just about hunger. It's about so much more. It's got social, political, economic, all tied into it. This is why when we talk about our food system, we're not just talking about producing food. We're talking about the perfection and cultivation of ourselves, of humanity, of the world around us. 
So we all want to focus on hunger, but we don't see it. We don't, we see it and don't look at that. It's just like the tip of the iceberg. There's so much other dimensions below it. Our agricultural system cultivates more patriarchy than maize, more racism than, than wheat. This is what it's doing in the world. And we have to recognize the cultural hegemonic powers, the ecological collapse, the neoliberal policies, the gender hegemonies. These are all part of the story. And so we can't just look at hunger. We have to look at something completely bigger. And this is why our food system is not broken. Everyone here has heard that in some New York Times headline, in some classroom, in some... I'm trying to censor my language. Some person's TED talk or whatever, right? They say the food system is broken. I'm here for a solution. What happens when something's broken? If this chair is broken, we look at a little cosmetic fix, a trim tab right over here. How do we ticker with this? Put a Band-Aid effect right there. That's what they want us to think. But yet the food system has its all-time profits, all-time yields, right? This is actually working for some people. It's not broken. It's designed exactly what it's doing. Instead, it's unjust. And we need to name it for what it is. Why? Because when we name it as unjust, we get to look at it for transformative change. We get to look for how to transform the system at the foundational level to create something rooted in the world that we want. And until we start recognizing that, we won't be able to have the change. We'll look at some design practice of permaculture, some app that's going over here, something over there, without radically reimagining how we grow our food and how we view ourselves in that ecosystem. This is what our food system is. I don't need to read all these out, but this is what it's rooted in. So it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And that's why food security is not the answer. Because you can be food secure in a prison where you have no choice of what you're eating, where you have no power of what's on your plate. And that's the metric that the world uses to determine success of agriculture. Because they think of us as beneficiaries of a food system, not active innovators and change makers. They don't think of it as our cultural DNA that's embedded into our bodies, into the ancestors, into our stories. So I want, Ron's going to talk about what is the metric to look at if it's not food security. Yeah, so we know focusing on hunger is hugely reductive and it is just uh, a symptomatic effect of a much larger problem, right? So the answer is not food security. The answer to us is about, you know, choice and power, the agency to do, to influence a system, to have, uh, to have the right, I mean, to have the agency to, you know, to sort of have control over the, your own choices. So there's this environmentalist Chico Mendes who says that environmentalism without the class struggle is just gardening, which means that if you do not confront injustice, then you're not really engaging in environmentalism because there are so many other injustices wrapped around uh, what what we like to, you know, greenwash and call, uh, call you know, food systems change. But at the same time, if we do not confront the power in the food system, if we do not confront injustice, then what are we really doing? So for us, the answer is food sovereignty. And food sovereignty is basically forcing us to question who gets the power to shape the food system. It, according to the Declaration of Naini, it's about the right of people to defi define and influence their own systems. And it's about all of our rights to culturally and healthy, appropriate, healthy and appropriately and culturally appropriate foods. So it's about the power of freedom, the freedom to grow what we want, the freedom to own the land that we live on, the freedom to save and exchange seeds without being, you know, pinned down by some corporate and being sued for intellectual property theft, the freedom to set fair prices. That's what food sovereignty is all about. And I know that this can feel daunting, right? Because we're not presenting a solution for you. We're not saying that, hey, guys, just compost, just drink paper straws and the world's going to be fine, right? Like, I, I get that. And this is why we love this quote, because I think it's really important for everyone here to realize that the world is something that we make and that we could just as easily make different. 
We don't have to live this way. We can imagine other ways of living, of relating. That is our right, our agency, and our power. It goes beyond a, a binary of, 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 of left or right, Marxism or capitalism, male or female. Like We can explore the realms of what is possible and cultivate that. And they could do everything they want to, to challenge our, our ability, our, our right to protest, our right to organize, but they can never take our right to imagine something fundamentally different and to fight for that. So at a growing culture, because I guess we should talk about at least one thing that we do, or like we're an organization, we're an international collective. Rohan is based in, in the South India here. Like he's, he's part of our amazing team. And if you've read any of our writing, Chances are it's this brilliant mind here that, you know, um, we represent multiple countries. We work with peasant, indigenous, and grassroots all over the world. And we are a creative agency, a storytelling organization, a design studio. And we work with communities 100% pro bono. They have to come to us to request our support. And we work in deep collaboration to shape narratives, stories, documentaries, films, websites, brochures, campaign posters, slogans, brands, identities. Why? Because don't for one second underestimate the power of story. And I think this is really important because we talked about the last presentation, we talked about misinformation, right? Like at, at a point she mentioned misinformation, right? During this pandemic, we heard during the authoritarianist governments that we don't need to name out loud, but we all know where they are, right? We can turn on the news and hear the same thing. Fake news, science is real, misinformation, all these claims around the world we're hearing. But yet, for one second, let's pause and reflect on that. Let's look at the forest and not the trees. What social interaction that we engage in, what social modality is informed by that fact, that logic, that reason? Our ethic and moral codes, thou shalt not kill, and so and so and so, are not based in fact. Our national identities are not based in fact. The difference between Pakistan and India is a story that we've been told. Honduras and Nicaragua is a story we've been told. Our faith systems are based in stories. White supremacy is not a fact, it's a story, but it's permeated everything that we do. Same with patriarchy, same with industrialization and capitalism. Stories shape and govern everything around us. We're here working for that conscious shift to fight that everyone can summon in themselves the, the, the courage to, to believe in, a, in, 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 in another world and the bravery to fight for it. And that comes from that story permeating our soul and awakening a seed that was once buried. But that has to take root one day. And that's what we do at a growing culture, working in deep collaboration with groups all around the world to support those stories, to build global solidarity, to challenge the false narratives that uphold complacency and unjust systems. Because at the root of everything, the root of everything is how we engage with the land that holds us. That's why at the root of the word colonization is Latin for colere. And colere means to cultivate because our agricultural system laid the groundwork for all of the oppressive systems that we exist in today. But it can be that double-edged sword. It can be used as that tool to exploit us, to extract nutrient from the ground and the soil, or it can be used to liberate us and regenerate humanity and cultivate the world we want. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, later or now? I was hoping that we could punch the questions and ask them at the end. So, because there are people waiting online. Uh, but thank you for taking us through this fascinating analysis. I'm sure there are many questions. And one of the questions which I'd like to ask. 
are later, but posing it right now is about what do you think of the many initiatives you've seen here between yesterday and today about local food and uh, foraging, things like that. Do you, how do you read those initiatives? And um, um, how do you think of stories which people like Anna Singh tell about mushrooms at the end of the world, for example, new ways of telling stories about foraging and capital markets, but all that for later. I just want to leave those questions with you uh, because I'm sure there'll be long discussions and we can club the discussion. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so I'm trying to also stick to time so that we have uh, don't keep the people uh, online waiting too long. Uh, our next uh, presentation is by uh, Margot Schwab. Uh, I believe she's in um, Switzerland, right? Is she there? Oh, I'm sorry, Mark is coming first. Okay. So I've been informed that there's a change of sequence from what I was told. So we have Mark Dusilier from of the founder of Hacketeria, who's going to go on next. And I'd like to see if he's there. Is he there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Mark. Hello. Welcome. Uh, were you able to hear the other two presentations? Yes, yes. the full okay. program. It was amazing. amazing. I was I really was enjoying, enjoying fantastic speakers. speakers. So welcome really to the assembly. to catch up. Right. Welcome to the assembly. I'll just briefly introduce you. Mm -hmm. um, Hacketeria is a web platform and collection of open source biological art projects instigated in February 2009 by Andy Gracie from UK, Mark Dusile from uh, Switzerland, and Yaha Shetty from India. Yaha Shetty has a long association with Swishti. Uh, after collaboration during the in Interactive OS 09, Garage Science at Media Lab Prado in Madrid. The aim of the project is to develop a rich wiki-based web resource for people interested in or developing projects that involve bio art, open source software, hardware, uh, DIY biology, art science collaborations, and electronic experimentation. Mark, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. That, sounds that sounds like, like a good text. text. It's, it's ancient. ancient. We, we, we may, may should update it. it. Hakira, Hakira has, has developed into maybe, maybe also other, other things. things. We, also we also still, still trying, trying to figure out. out what we're what doing. We're doing. Um, um, I, will I will present a bit the history of Acteria because it's very connected to also the activities that are happening now, also this connection to Shristi. So it's nice that I can also remotely present. Um, <clears throat> I also, I just got back from, from Slovenia, from Maribor, where we did another um, project over the last two years called Urosh. You maybe see in the background a little turning logo. Um, Urosh stands for Ubiquitous Rural open science hardware. Um, we were also looking very much into some of our more technical and hacker practices to what extent they could be used in the rural context in agriculture and in different parts of the world. Uh, what you also see in the background is my, my Ah, I was muted. Sorry. I clicked the wrong button. So I was just telling some stories and you didn't hear me, I think. Um, so I will give a bit of a background of how we started Hacteria as an internet platform. That's also why you see I'm talking to you from the internet. This is how it's, it looks like. Um, I've been like a child of the early computer scene in the late 80s and 90s, and I was always thinking this is how the internet should look like. Um, you also see in the background um, some data I'm collecting at the moment from different places in Slovenia, where I come just came back from a pro project called Urosh. 
the ubiquitous rural open science hardware activities, where we looked into to what extent some of this technical and do-it-yourself and open source project can be also be useful, maybe, in the rural context, in the agricultural context, and in remote communities across different places in the world. Um, we see CO2 monitoring in the background. <clears throat> When I talk about CO2 monitoring, I don't mean, I don't talk about the climate. Um, these are um, sensors I installed in different art spaces in Slovenia. So they mostly show human activity at the moment. So obviously in Maribor, in the Hack Lab, the Photograph Museum, there's a lot of people. Mark, Mark I'm like sorry to interrupt you. Just for a second, we are missing your screen. Just could you just hold for a second, please, while we'll we fix yeah. it. Could we have Mark on the screen, please, full screen? Tech team. Mm. So I'm. What you should see on the screen is the internet, how it used to yeah, look like. So Mark, we are not. We are seeing ourselves on the screen for some reason. Uh -huh. So kindly bear with us. Uh, maybe Tech you have team. to make me presenter or something. <laughs> yeah, remote pen. He, he, that's he has to do that. Yeah, you have a remote. You have to remove the pin on your screen. I'm. I've been told. You have, a, have pin, a pin. A pin. Oh, it's us. It's us. No, I don't have any I'm pin. Looking at the tech team. I don't have any pin. Oh, now you're a little better. We're trying to get you full screen, Mark. Replace pin. Replace pin. He says. Remove all pens. Right. Great. Okay, Mark, you're on. Okay. You did hear what I was saying before, I hope. So I'm calling to you through the internet. It's something some of us have been quite used to the last two years. Some others like myself, I've been doing a lot of online remote work since I used the computer in the late 80s. Um, these were fantastic presentations. I was... Uh, uh, blown away very different aspects but a lot of stuff also i think i'm very interested in my own practice but also in the practice that i present which is also presenting a larger global network which is called the Inter global hacteria network that we did start in bangalore together with yasha shetty at shrishti for a long time um i can show some slides click this and click this so i'm using my own presentation software um, called Open Broadcast System. I hope you see something. Um, I want to start with this quote that I found recently about these collaborative practices that I think has been shaping the Hacteria network very much. It is about spending time together and not only giving talks like here, but also really working together, which usually takes more than a couple of days, but a couple of weeks. Um, I found this quote, coming together is a beginning and keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Yeah, I only recently figured out it's from Henry Ford. He's not maybe my most favorite intellectual. He's been kind of quite, you know, mass manufacturing. And I think he was also a Nazi. I'm sorry about that, but I still like the quote. Um, so, oh gosh, reflecting on Hacteria's collaborative practices in a global do it with others context. So that's a bit the title of my presentation. Um, I have to go to this and then click here. Yeah, so myself, I'm, my name is Mark Dussey, online in the time when on the internet no one used their own names. Um, I'm usually under the name Dusjager, but I have many other names like Pade Mardono when I travel the world. I'm involved in Hacteria for a long time, also in something that's maybe like an electronics and maker space in Switzerland called the Swiss Mechatronic Art Society. I'm also involved with the Gosch. And this is partially related to the end of my talk today, the gathering for open science hardware. I'm also part of the center on, like this is my small company I have, the Center for Alternative Coconut Research. And the most recent project we have been doing is Urosh, or also called Roja. I will talk about it later. Um, this is when I usually hang out myself in the rural context in Switzerland. I, I, I'm lucky that I inherited a small house. Um, from my grand grandfather. It's also been a meeting spot for many of my international collaborators. On the photo, you see some of my collaborators from Karkana in Nepal, some of my collaborators from Lifepatch from Indonesia, 
one of the artists from South Africa, a child of an artist from the United States, and my almost little sister from my hometown, Schaffhausen. So it's, for me, extremely interesting to reflect on some of the more technical stuff that I do. I live in a big city in Zurich, kind of big. I visit big cities like Bangalore or Jakarta. But for me, it's extremely important to draw back to a place that is off-grid. It has solar power. It has a dry toilet and yeah, collecting water from the rain. Um, my other, let's say, home base that I've been working a lot is a community, art community run space called Life Patch. They also have a kind of a 10 year already existence. I've been collaborating with them since the very beginning. And they call themselves a citizen initiative for art, science and technology. And it's a place that's been extremely influential. It's also where I recently tried to make some business under my brand, Pade Marjono. I make stickers. I also um, transport stickers all over the world. I make them very, very cheap. Um, trying to make a little bit of money on the side, which of course is not so serious. Um, with this sticker mania, I try to reflect uh, the kind of the networks and the collaborative activities that have been involved in most of the project I was organizing um, with the Hacteria network. Um, there's always a lot of groups, a lot of individuals, a lot of collectives, a lot of spaces involved and trying to represent this diversity. Huh? So I make a lot of stickers. They're all open source. You can download them. Um, Maribor is the future to Indus Luch and Instrumentasia and so forth. And so this is what I do. I also make t-shirts. Um, when I was in Indonesia and heard some quote from Documenta, I thought I'd make a t-shirt that some of this practice in collectives is more about making friends than making art. And I think a lot of the players that are involved at the soil assembly at the moment are also some hybrid where it's not so clear if it's art, if it's activism, or if it's also networking activities, or if it's just producing food somewhere. Um, I have the luck to have a lot of international and global experiences. It definitely has shaped my practice and my view on the world. I want to talk a bit more about that. For those of you who followed uh, different activities around um, Documenta, although there was some also very difficult discussions, I was personally very happy to be also involved with a lot of those people um, talking to them in Indonesia, but also seeing that they set up a proper toilet that is, let's say, inclusive for both the global north and the global south. I hope you get my meme jokes over there. Um, something I learned. Yeah, there's a lot of T-shirts out there, stickers, and you can download everything with an open source license. So my roots. Um, my roots are very much in this more geeky and technology and computer scene from the late 80s. My, my visions of the world and the future has been shaped by this dystopian cyberpunk fantasies where in the future it's going to be a, small, a few small corporations that govern what we eat and what we consume as media. Sadly, it might have happened. But some other things of the internet or the, at that time maybe it was called metaverse in some of these books, if you know books like Neuromancer or Snow Crash. Um, these visions of the future have very much shaped, let's say, me as a teenager. And I'm sometimes shocked how, yeah, the ideas and the visions of the future haven't much changed. Huh? At the same time, I got a technical background. I was studying um, material science and I did a PhD in nanotechnology, interfacing the artificial with the living. This was, let's say, my steps into some of this um, interdisciplinary work. And other things were coming up in the, what some of us call bio art. People were growing their own meat in the laboratory as a critical comment also to the food industry. Maybe you know the work by Symbiotica, uh, Victimless Leather. It was meant as a joke. It's kind of surprising to me that this became a business that we start to grow meat in the Petri dish as a kind of, well, we're gonna solve all the climate problems and the food. Um, the food crisis, what was, I think, very well put together. There is not a broken food system. It's other political and societal um, things that have to change. Um, this techno-solutionism, I'm quite opposed to, meanwhile, but again, like growing organs in the lab, in kind of a backyard shed, it's something I totally thought was normal when I was in my fantasy worlds in the 80s. Um, briefly, um, maybe Maya is also very involved in this space in Zurich. We have what we call a hacker space in Zurich um, with the Swiss Mechatronic Art Society. Um, 
that we luckily have a much bigger space now, which also allowed us to set up finally an uh, open science lab for these more biological activities, hacker, bio, bio art activities. It's also the workplace, both for Maya, Minder and myself and other people. Um, when I talk about open science, um, I don't mean that there is this academic research and we have access to that knowledge like as a general society, but I do mean open science also that the, the process of creating knowledge is open to all players in the world. It's indigenous knowledge, it's um, artists working on it, and also the scientists themselves are part of the larger, let's say, um, science endeavor. Um, so just very briefly, I jump over with the Swiss Mechatronic Art Society. We like to make synthesizers and workshops. I think my own practice and Hacteria has been mostly shaped by developing creative workshops to introduce people through a hands-on approach to also larger technical issues, um, technical, let's say, knowledge. But all of those mean also something about what means this science and technology in our society. Huh? And somehow through this DIY synthesizer workshops, I ended up um, in Indonesia in 2009. I got invited to make synthesizer workshops and in a place called Jogjakarta, the special district of Jogjakarta DIY, Dera Istimeva Jogjakarta. It's a small sultanate on the island of Java, which is also kind of a cultural capital or hub of the whole um, Indonesia. But on the same trip, I was also here. This was, I think, the roof of SIMA, the Center of Experimental Media Arts, in its old, let's say, shape and house, and did a workshop together with Yasha Shetty, building synthesizers. I don't know what the text means there. Maybe someone knows what it even means. I don't know. Uh, at the same time, it also Yasha's, we're talking a lot, and we started the Center for Alternative Coconut Research when we went to Goa to put some sensors into coconut to measure the motion of the waves. And we were thinking about what it means, these local materials and local knowledges. And so as a bit of a joke, I kept that brand, the Center of Alternative Coconut Research for my private small company. Uh, we, we, I really enjoyed uh, maps. There was uh, some fantastic max, maps before. So um, I do spend a lot of time in this coconut belt which is of course around the tropics and it's also close to the seaside and you are there now um, somewhere here in the in the coconut region kerala also known as the coconut state as i remember um i like about this map it already shows some aspects of the world in its right shape but having this opportunity to work and live both in bangalore and in indonesia um it really ch changed the way i looked at the at the map and Oh, yeah, this is a map I, I always like to show. Um, there's, these maps are, are highly um, charged by, by cultural, historical views of the world. Um, the Mercato protect, protection is a heavily colonial view of the world with Germany in the center and kind of the, the, where the resources are extracted from in the outer, outer parts. And you can look at the world from many different sides. And for those of you who don't know, the Earth is like a globe. It's round, um, it's very difficult to project it on a two-dimensional surface. And places like Indonesia, um, we talked already about the diversity of India. I think some of us European, we don't really have a clear guess for that. Um, if you don't have, if you haven't been there really. So I tried to visualize the diversity of Indonesia in this place where we, what we all know here in Europe, we all know these shapes of our countries. And if we put them all over the islands of Indonesia, they see how, how, how widely it's spanning and how, how broadly it will, will also, of course, include even more diversity than other places of the world, how we have seen on a map on the previous presentation. Uh, um, so in Indonesia, I was involved in setting up this kind of community collective art space, which is some people live there. It's also a, a laboratory for people to work on electronics and fermentation, on agriculture, on gardening, but it's also a, a hangout place for people outside and friends of the community. And I was ha happily involved there since its foundation in 2012. Uh, we make electronics, so partially I will talk about more the hardware aspects today. Um, we try to make simple 
sensors for um, different applications from sound to also environmental monitoring. Or in this case, what you look at is like look, um, making music with um, larvae from the mosquitoes. And yeah, this is what we do. So um, in 2009, together with Yasha Shetty, Andy Gracie, but I would say also with Urs Gaudens and many people joined later, we started a web platform called um, hecteria.org. Luckily, it's still active um, as a website. I hope you will all look at it later. It's about open source as a cultural phenomena, as a, as a value system, the value of sharing, a very value of collaborating and building on each other's knowledge, but also giving the credits to everybody who has done some work with it. Um, it's a global network. What something that brings us together is definitely this vision or this dream that a radical transdisciplinarity approach is maybe the only way to really um, tackle these global challenges we have in this time in these times. Um, we started, as was mentioned in the beginning, at an event which has already this, this I think, the typical format. It was called Garage Science Interactivos. We spent with a group of maybe 50 or even 80 people 10 days in a place just collaborating on, on work in progress, on prototypes. Nothing has to be finished. No, no, not a specific art form has to be shown. Artwork has to be shown at the end. But it was about documentation using online tools, using open source tools, such as wikis and, and these things. Um, and that's where I met Yashas and we thought, this is interesting. While we want to continue that spirit of open source culture, um, we also, also want to broaden it more to biological topics, to uh, laboratory practices, um, to, yeah, to life instead of more, let's say, the open hardware and open software movements. And yeah, we, we worked with water bears and microscopes and we build our own laboratories wherever we can. The idea was that well, we don't need to have access to a scientific laboratory, but with a little bit of DIY knowledge and also an online resource with how to's, people can build their own lab. And we do think by building your own lab, you have some, some sense of ownership of the laboratory and less dependent on, on these hierarchies of, of academic science labs. Yeah, and this was one of the first workshops we did in Bangalore at, in the art science. Meanwhile, it's called, I think, the art science lab, or I think it keeps changing. So we did the first workshop in Shrishti with the students building microscopes. I think this is a photo from that very workshop. Maybe some of the people that were at the workshop are still in the audience. That would be funny. Um, so with this kind of foundation um, values, um, we have been going on for many years. Um, my personal contributions are partially connecting these networks, but then also some technical open source hardware developments, while other people do much more artwork related stuff or they do yeah, many different things. So, so yeah, so uh, the microscope was at the very roots of our activity, like giving a tool, uh, very low cost and very DIY to the people to explore the world around them, to explore their own body, um, to explore the soils, and it's also a workshop that has been that has been going on for many years. It's been picked up by many other people. I think it's one of the best examples of of kind of an empowerment, but also a playful and joyful um, interaction with scientific in, in instrumentation, scientific tools. Ah, oh, yeah, this workshop has been done in in Bangalore, in Indonesia, um, it also in Norway where the whole city was banning to talk to, about our activities because we were playing with animals just for fun, for art, whatever, fun, art, I don't know where it's defined. But again, um, one of my personal activities is very much into making laboratory equipment accessible through a low cost approach, through a DIY approach. I do this I even like for yeah, many, many years. Um, through building your own equipment, it gives you some kind of ownership, it gives you some deeper understanding. It also allows you to, to be creative and design um, these objects in a way that they convey totally different messages. This is one example, a more clean example of making your own laboratory using tools from digital manuf manufacturing, such as laser cutters, 3D printers, and these files for manufacturing can be shared online. Um, so if you want to look at it, um, it is announced as a web platform on, on your um, list of participants. This is also, I think, was the founding idea. Um, 
it's semi-successful as a web platform, but it does have a huge archive of activities that might be some inspiration for you. Um, it became maybe more, let's say, a small global network of continuous collaborations and friend friendships that have grown with a large, let's say, areas from Europe, India, and Southeast Asia. This is a big coincidence of the founding years. Uh, but we do have a strong also, um, I think, responsibility to still promote open source tools. Um, I'm happy to be on a Zoom call, but there is other options, don't worry. Um, so all the tools we provide for online collaboration, it's not something we had to invent for the pandemic. It's something we had in place already for a decade. Um, so we use MediaWiki to document our work. It's a collaborative writing, text writing, um, we can write instructions, we know who wrote what, and we can edit each other's um, texts. Um, we also have a discussion forum on the internet using Discourse and other open source software. We have more, let's say, a crafting a mind map tool called um, Hot Glue. You find it, the website's all here. And we have our own cloud run on Nextcloud. You've, the website is mega.techdira.org. So for the larger collaborative community, we also provide all these open source tools for online collaboration and being kind of a bit of a togetherness. Um, during the pandemic, we also um, installed this tool, which was fantastic. It's kind of a gamified interactivity platform where you walk around with your characters and if you meet someone, you can have a little call to each other. It's less, let's say, less weird than Zoom because you can just hang out also with a small group in the corner during a conference and have a little chat while some other speakers are talking on the other side. Um, these are all still intact. You are, everybody's welcome to use them. Um, I mentioned already that it's been a very global activity. Um, we, since the very early times, we also bridged from the more, let's say, technical, uh, making your microscopes or synthesizers into traditional agroecological and political topics. For example, when I saw my friends doing wine, like alcoholic fermentation from tropical fruits in Indonesia, this was for me mind blowing that we can talk about molecules, about genetics, about all these bacteria, but at the same time, I'm also looking into traditional fermentation recipes and have alcohol for the parties also. Yeah, and so this all this connection brought me to Slovenia. Um, it was somehow a coincidence that my I ended up in a country called Slovenia. It's somewhere near Italy and Austria. Um, yeah, but again, the fermentation keeps coming up and we do workshops all over the world and we found more other, let's say, support for this, let's say, art and open source culture. It was really thriving, I would say, in the late 2000s. Sadly, the open source mindset has been a bit disappearing recently. But it made me think a lot and go back to the title of the presentation like if we already bring people together if we have some kind of a gathering um why how can we make the best out of that intellectual let's say potential that when people come together i'm personally quite bored of formats of presentations but we're doing one now um we also thought if there is an art festival why not make more out of this and so we had this kind of idea that even a festival should be a, a, a laboratory a laboratory is a space for collaboration for human beings to work together share um space share share play places to sleep share place um, eat together and so forth sadly it doesn't work so often often laboratories are thought as a technical kind of infrastructure or an art show is some things that we just as an outside observer see, and I'm really more interested in making people to work together instead of this. And this is something we're still discussing. Uh, what, what is the role of, of the soil assembly or what is the role of a festival? And a festival is a moment that historically defined celebrates a community or people having a common interest or a common religion. It's time to create an event that comes to break the repetition and rigorous aspects of daily life. Uh, so it's something I'm really interested in, that really creating these temporary activities of, of, of conviviality, of, of real humans spending time together in space and time. And I think Maya's practice has been very much aligned with similar things of hospitality and food practices as a creating an environment also for intellectual interactions and discourse and even producing new knowledges. Um, so we have done a lot of these events. Uh, we call them Hectira Lab in Zurich. We figured out it has to be longer. Um, in 
the mountains in Switzerland in an old monastery, this temporary laboratory um, for collaborative research and productions. Um, again, you see Yashos, our old co-founder, and the other co-founder, Andy Gracie. We work with Indonesians on making wine. We, we go to hike, we have fire, and we kind of talk about art and food and technology and yeah and so some of these prototypes are developed during these sessions call them also hack sessions um, maybe they're playful maybe they're not functional but some of these prototypes over many years even developed into products um, we again the fermentation keeps coming up um, we also did one in bangalore in collaboration with Trishti and um, ncbs the national center for biological science where we brought together about 30 people for two weeks and um, living together, doing workshops with the students, with visiting different places and so forth. And again, I, I do think it's extremely important to tackle these global aspects also to be a bit more aware of the di diversity of different approaches, different cultures, by really bringing people to these other places. It's hard sometimes for us here in Europe to imagine um, how, how deeply developed cultures are around and, and how little we even know about that. And one thing about working a lot in India, I'm always very impressed that I, I, and I tell this to my friends here, like most Indian intellectuals, uh, like educated people that I'm, I talk to, I would say they all know twice as much as we do because they do know a lot through the history also of the, their own colonial history about European history, but they also know a lot about Indian history, 500 gods and I don't know, not a single a single one of them. And Indonesia itself is even super diverse. It had kind of interactions with all cultures of the world, I would say, and it kind of merged into its own also uniqueness and it's super diverse within it, its own borders anyway. So these are very global intercultural meetings that we try to organize and what always have, it's like very durational. It's not so structured just with talks. It's really more like a laboratory, a hack lab where people work on whatever they want and groups are formed to not come up with a final product or a final project, but kind of maybe start a new collaboration or just learn from each other. Maybe even if it's a, a, a recipe for a, for some food that you cook together. Um, yeah, so these are a bit the events we do and yeah, gatherings, we call them. And when Maya and me started to work, work together in 2017, of course, the first thing we did is organize something like that again in Switzerland. Um, out of Hack Deer Lab 2017, it was also called Biohack Retreat Klöntal. Um, we found out that a lot of people in our community, this like network, are really interested in soil. Um, it suddenly became like a, a, a subject that brings together people from thousands of different disciplines. And so we started the whole Homo sapiens and other activities afterwards. So this is a bit the history of, of the soil. So it came again out of um, the soil interest and also projects around it came from this gathering that we organized in Switzerland. And it then led to many kind of projects under the Homo sapiens. Um, everything is documented. You see the link there. I will hurry up. I've got a warning that time is up. Um, and yeah, so there's a lot of stuff. I will not talk about how we how we catch our own food, like hunting for rabbits and catching, eating poop. These are other stories. Um, but I want to briefly mention some of the influential other gatherings I've been involved. Um, the GOSH, the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, um, which is more about science, but a lot of activists there also, um, and about open hardware for empowering citizen initiatives, activists and teachers and creatives and, and so forth. And as a community, we were pretty successful in writing down our values and manifest the roadmap and so forth. And then instead of these global activities, we thought let's continue giving some funds to the regional activities. So I just came back, as I said, from Maribor, where we did, <coughs> where we did the temporary autonomous lab for trying to learn if some of these DIY instruments like the soil CO2 sensors, like the microscope, to what extent can we really apply them in agriculture or in the rural settings? It's an ongoing research also from, let's say, application and take, call it knowledge and technology transfer and learning from different farmers. And we're not yet so successful in really 
like putting it in use in the agriculture environment. Some of the friends are from Argentina, from Japan, from Indonesia and so forth. And so during the pandemic, it was a nice way to keep connected, but also physically again, meet in Maribor for a three weeks temporary um, autonomous laboratory while being connected to each other. Yeah, what came out of it was another uh, event called Rosha. Again, uh, one month residency more on sound art. And I show some photos. This is kind of where we have been ending up. Uh, this project, and I, I really enjoy it, how they have been within this Hakira network and Ghosh network and other networks have been spread out. So the continuity of these networks and that we keep working together, which brings us back to the original title. And using an individual fund or whatever project, just like a little step in this continuation of, of coming together and working together. So it, some of these projects went to the Goshi in Cameroon, and this is, I showed already, and what else? So I just finished this Uros Rota project technically from my contract, and it's ready for roundup. So now I'm really happy to think what the fuck have we been doing? And also think about why is it sometimes that these artists are involved in these topics of food security, isn't this a political topic and so forth. So with this, I want to end. Um, I want um, to change my slides to something else here. Um, you, as I said, you find everything on the wiki. Um, I can also show you the wiki. It should be in the background of, of, my, of my slides now. I mentioned this CO2 monitoring. Obviously, someone opened the window here in Maribor, and you find also a lot of information here. Um, you see also we have a lot of people involved in this recent Gurosh Gosh Roja from Japan, GMT plus nine. No one from India this time with this 4.5. And yeah, these are the people that have been involved in the ubiquitous rural open science hardware activities, and there's links. We also made two signs. I hope Maya brought them or you can print them. Uh, we worked on soil chromatography, um, soil respiration measurements. Uh, we did workshops with the communities in Argentina. And yeah, we built fish ponds. And I personally, again, was more on a technical project to measure the CO2 that comes out of the soil, which I've been working on for many years. Some of this stuff takes a long time. Yeah, with this more or less, I want to end. Um, the signs you also find here on this website, um, a short guide to soil, soil microscopy. We, will, we have it in four different languages. Feel free to in, translate it to whatever one of those five or many of those 500 Indian languages. So we made little signs that are easy to share to do workshops with a focus on soil, using a microscope to look at the soil or to use for soil chromatography. Um, which is more like the holistic kind of anthroposophic method, but it's still fun to do. Maybe you have heard of it. Yeah, with this, I want to end. There's some photos. There's more links. Um, it goes on and on and on. Um, cool. I think I'm done. I hope there are thousands of questions. Yes, uh, Mark, I'm sure there are. Thank you for the presentation. You said you hated the uh, presentation format, but that was a brilliant presentation. Nonetheless, I uh, love the playfulness and, and the terminology used and the basic spirit of bringing democracy to technology and science. And I'd love to know how all of us can participate in your projects a bit more. But if you just hold on there while we go to the next presentation and then We'll have hosts of questions for all the four participants. I have no doubt. The next presentation is uh, uh, with uh, uh, Margot Schwab, uh, maybe speaking from Switzerland. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah>. Margot. <laughs> Later, Thank everyone. You. Sorry. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce you to everybody here and then give you the floor. Uh, Margot Schwabs lives and works between Berlin, Germany and Peve, Switzerland. She's a cultural producer and curator working at the intersection of art, ecology and hospitality, prioritizing spaces outside the gallery context. In 2016, she founded Food Culture Days, 
a knowledge sharing platform around food ecologies and politics. Food Culture Day serves as a catalyst for discussions and actions to environmental and social claims, employing a biennial format that hosts a multitude of creative and culinary interventions in Pueve. So I'll just stop there and let you take it on from there. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for this nice introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Yep. Here. Okay. So thank you so much first for, for the, the nice and the very powerful presentation. I am really blown away by the different the different speakers or the invitations. I'm the founder and director of Food Culture Days. Food Culture Days is a knowledge sharing platform interested in the interesting link between food and ecology. And uh, as, uh, as 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 mentioned before, I'm uh, I live in uh, in Switzerland in Vevey, but also I'm in between Berlin and, and Switzerland. I'm Swiss Mexican. My mom is Mexican, and uh, I really believe as um, that art as a vector for uh, emancipation and also community building. And this is where also food culture days uh, is emanating from. So. What is Food Culture Days first? Food Culture Days is a platform more than anything else, is a platform that is um, sharing knowledge and know-how and practices. Um, and we are interested in the interesting link between food and ecology. We use art and culture to, to disseminate and amplify uh, our research and, 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 and the community of practice that we work with. So, The, as the production transformation and concept are some most pressing challenges for collective transformation, as also a growing culture really beautifully um, uh, mentioned mentioned it. And um, in this in this context, Food Culture Days um, has the vision of rediscovering the multiple multiple meaning and function of food in a daily life as well as the tangible and imperceptible impact of our choices on the global environment. The platform brings together artists, scientists, farmers, cooks, winemakers, philosophers, biologists, anthropologists, activists, gardeners, local experts, grandmothers, grandfathers, and other forms of intelligence, uh, fungal, bacterial, mineral, animal, interested in food as a research, as a research subject, as much as a medium for convivial uh, interaction. We are uh, based in, uh, in Vevey in Switzerland. Um, and uh, it's a very small city. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, very small, it's relative, but it's a small city like in, in, in Switzerland, medium to small, 20,000 citizens. And um, something important to mention about Vevey is that it's also the headquarter of Nestlé, the worldwide headquarter of Nestlé actually the Swiss headquarter and the worldwide headquarter of Nestle. So, um, of course, this is like very important also uh, for our situatedness and to understand why the project also like um, was, uh, was born. So the notion, um, the notion of the, 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 well, let's say first the context is that, of course, like there is at the time of, of ecological and social issues affecting an ever more increasing liver, uh, number of living organisms. We all, and also the collective consciousness, um, is raising and attempting to comprehend those matters. And this is in, this is the, 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 when food culture days, uh, was born. Uh, we apprehend those uh, global topics rooted in a local context. For example, the fact that we are in the same city than the headquarter of Nestlé, but also like the ecology around Vevey is uh, quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, it's very specific. We have the Alps, but we also have the lake, um, and and this is important for us to address global topic rooted in a local uh, context. 
We do that through different formats. We do that through Convivia, democratic, and mainly free of cost formats. For example, exhibition, performances, intervention, public space, radio shows, publication. We really like to experiment with different formats and different practitioners. And I really believe that this, um, this notion of experimentation, especially like in Switzerland, is, is, is important to, to fight for, let's say. So we propose moment of encounter where food, plants, minerals, animals are apprehended for, um, for what they, they say about ourselves and the, the, the environment we, we, the environment we, 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 we inhabit. So the notion of platform is also immensely important for me because it has this notion of um, bringing together. Um, I personally don't come from the cultural and the art background. I did the hospitality like management school in Switzerland, but this notion of hospitality and of, um, and of, yeah, this notion of bringing together around the table was something that always motivated me a lot and, and I was very passionate about. And because I believe that art is this vector of emancipation and circulation of knowledge and community building, I choose art and culture to as a modus operandi. But I was I still really wanted to 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 stay in this um, in this field of hospitality. So I brought everything together, like in the uh, in this uh, in in this uh, within, within this platform, a platform as a, a bridge, uh, a cre creating bridges, creating relationships. And we all know that food is, uh, is, is all about relationships. So something also that I want to mention is the fact that um, within this platform and we, when we bring together different um, field of expertise, um, we, 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 we really try to not hierarchize, hierarchize uh, the knowledges. For us, really, everyone is an expert in their domain and um, um, fields, marketplace, um, um, public spaces, domestic, domestic spaces like kitchen, for example, are also really potent spaces for knowledge circulation and, um, and conviviality. So, um, yeah, this is, um, very important for us. So now I come. So this was the platform. This is the, like the umbrella project, let's say, that you see, um, here. And then, um, the main project is, uh, a Biennale format. That happen every two years in Vevey, but we also do field research. We also have an editorial digital platform that we launched in September, and then we also have, of course, like a lot of um, a lot of different uh, collaborations. So I remember when I when I started Food Culture Days, I was thinking, oh, hey, it's it's interesting. Human have always been defined by the tools and also the technologies that um, they were they were using. Started with agriculture, with fire, windmills, transportation, smartphone, and so I was asking myself, what tools do we need to create? To to what tool do we need in order to create? To to let's say to do the work that we we want to do with this platform, and also what tools do we need to build a strong community that can support uh, these uh, these goals and support other communities' goals. Um, could a platform like Food Culture Days be a kind of technology in itself? And this is how also the, the different projects uh, started. For example, the field research, Boca Boca, and the, the collaboration. And of course, also the, the Biennale, because we really believe in the, in the power of being together. Um, so by radical, by practicing radical hospitality, Food Culture Days invites a trans transgenerational audience to connect and engage in urgent social and environmental issues, such as our relationship with the environment, soils narrative and foodscapes, seed and access to, to, to resources and, um, cultural identity and the notion of terroir, the narrative stemming from migration, colonization, collective memory and the production of knowledge, as well as the question, as well as some question concerning the value of tradition within experimenting um, potential and desi desirable futures. So I'm going to start with the, our main project, uh, one of the tools, the one of the, that we, that we use to, 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 um, to address like those uh, those topics, which is um, the Biennale in Vevey. The Biennale is 
It's basically 10 days, historically four, but now like 10 since 2023, uh, also because we wanted to um, to slow down like the rhythm of like the Biennale, let's say, and this four days very quickly, very quickly. Um, so we decided to do 10 days, but historically it was four. And um, basically we invite artists and all the practitioners that I mentioned before to come together um, and to present uh, some work. Um, it's um, visual arts, performing arts, some project of arch architecture in the public space, projections, uh, talks, but also some perennial, um, some perennial action on the territory. For example, this year we planted like a planetary wheat field with ancient uh, grains in order to to bring people together to the field and to use this field and this um, this one year of cultivation as a place for interaction and exchange about um, resources, uh, seed appropriation, food sovereignty, and also some more like science-based um, experiments. So this uh, Biennale, how does it work? Basically, because we don't want to stay in our little bubble, um, we launch an open call um, every every two years, an international open call that usually um, is also a good way for us to see like who who has access to what we what we produce and what we do, and who feels also called by this open call. And we're always very happy to see that scientists, anthropologists, philosophers, artists are answering in a, in a myriad of, of, of ways and with very different uh, type of projects. Um, we have um, access of curation um, during, this, um, during this Biennale. You can see some pictures here of some, some projects. We have some access of curation uh, this year in 2023, uh, 2023. We decided to work around subjects that um, that they arise, they arise from the field research. Uh, they are, they represent some urgencies and topics that uh, were brought, let's say, visible to or make visible to us through the field research. And this year, um, so there is three axes. It's not really thematic. It's more axes. One is the territory uh, as a space for confrontation between local and global dynamics. Second is the commons, considered, considered as an, as a uh, place for experimentation and framework, um, uh, for organization and social action model. And then the artistic creation, um, axis, which is really asking ourselves the potential and role, um, of the artistic creation in addressing social and environmental challenges. So here you can see like, yeah, different projects. In, in Vevey, different spaces, for example, the, the Indonesian um, collective Bakudapan that uh, we already worked with in the past, Christian Sleiman, and this is uh, the, the pilot project of Alexandra Baumgartner, the planetary Whitfield, like before the one she did in, in Vevey. So, um, and this is for us, like really just finishing with the, with the Biennale for us is really the momentum is really the moment where we try to get the most people come to the Biennale because also it's free of charge, uh, except for the meals that we ask for, for a donation or sometimes we have also different prices. But, um, it's really the moment that we want to be with each other and to exchange and to leave the different projects, um, together. So. With the, the huge, let's say, privileges that Switzerland also has in terms of funding, in terms of resources, we believe that it's also our, like our part of our job to also redistribute those resources um, and create an event where, um, like, as much people as possible can also um, uh, join. And we're still learning every day about how to do that uh, um, the best. Um, okay, that was for the Biennale. And then um, we have the field research uh, that I won't talk too much about it today because I want to focus on the two other, which is more the Boca Boca and the collaboration. But we just finished those six months uh, field research uh, in Europe and also in uh, in Mexico. Um, and it's an ongoing research. Like we don't want to just like stay in Europe at all, but we also believe that it's very important to first like understand our environments in order to then create bridges, um, with other geographies. Um, about Boca Boca, which is the online editorial project that we launched in September. Here again, it was for us 
um, a way of um, basically giving the, our community of practice uh, a, a, a tool and a place where we could deepen some of the thematics that um, uh, we present during the Biennale, but it's every two years, so sometimes it feels a little bit like, wow, we need to wait so long to actually share and, and exchange about topics that interest us. But also we were thinking about how can we... Um, like share governance in a way, like or share um, ownership with this platform. Um, so the way it works is that we invite guest editors in each cycle. Um, we are not the the, the one like um, uh, the only like guest uh, like editors. Let's say we invite guest editors, and then they can commission with a specific like budget that we we offer. They can commission a multimedia um, multimedia projects. And the way we see that also, and it worked pretty well with the first cycle, is, okay, with these resources, the, the initial resources, we can create a digital project that sometimes is easy to, easier to produce because it's digital. But then with this cycle, the, the, the practitioners, the guest editors, and also the artists that participated in the cycle and produce works can go and ask for, uh, like, um, um, extra funding, for example. So the first cycle that was around um, the commons, um, and we created with uh, with uh, Tamires uh, um, Matarozzi and Alejandra Monteverde um, from Brazil and Peru. It allowed them to go back with the like the funding bodies and say, okay, this is already the research that we've done. Now we want to do it in an anal we would like to do it in an analog way in Brazil or in Peru. Are you are you in? And it worked with this first cycle. So it's also like how to redistribute what we what we have as resources um, here. Um, yeah, it's text, it's uh, multimedia. Um, so yeah, this is a, a great tool to deepen a bit the thematic because also I feel social media is great, but again, it's it's so quick. Like we don't really go deep into the into the um, into the the, the thematics. Um, and then the collaboration, which is also a very important and a very beautiful um, um, part of Food Culture Day since the beginning, because it's uh, it's 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 a it's a Swiss project, but has has a, a, an international reach. Um, I want to present three of those uh, collaboration uh, that we've been doing. Um, the first one is the most recent one. It's called Fungi Cosmology. Um, it's a three-year residency um, between um, uh, Lab Vergi in Brazil, in the Amazon, Cap Patagonia, in Tierra del Fuego, in Chile, and Switzerland, uh, in the Alps. And um, uh, it's an art and science kind of, uh, yeah, long-term residency program where the older practitioners, so scientists, artists, and curators are traveling to different territories and um, researching around uh, the, the fungi, the relevance of the fungi, and also the, the what language can we um can we create uh, and elaborate uh, what what what. I don't like the term new, but what, what alternative also, um, knowledge and, and language can we develop through, through the meeting, through a cross, through the crossroad of art and science also. Um, then we have more, also we have some, uh, collaboration in Switzerland. I know that Anne Laure Franchette, uh, with Teti and also Gabby, uh, spoke before about Teti Mobile Soil. So we did like an event with them in Zurich in the greenhouse of, um, of Kenza. And, um, again, a, a way for us to experiment with different formats, with food, with arts, with agroecology. And the, the best was that we could, we, there was a, a series of three uh, events and we could experiment with, okay, do we want to be seated? Do we want to be uh, stand, standing? Do we want to be moving? And it, it's great to have those kind of uh, experimentation, like in general, to have feedback, to have time to have feedback with the pe with people, with practitioners, with the people involved and the public also. And then we also did like in, uh, because I'm, I'm also based in Berlin, we did a collaboration with a newspaper that is called Arts of the Working Class uh, in Berlin. Um, um, they came to us saying like, we really like, like what you do with food culture days. Should, should we try to just, um, concise a little bit that uh, through exchanges and concise that in the, the extra blatt, which is a supplement of, um, the edition about food that was called, um, by the hand that feeds you, uh, food eats the soul. That was the number 16, 
that you can also still buy online, which is really, really powerful and great. Um, and here, because it was the COVID edition, like of Food Culture Days in 2020, the Biennale edition, like in the middle of COVID, um, we decided to turn certain projects into like a, a newspaper um, version. So this is the kind of the 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 yeah also the the result the fruit of this of this collaboration and then because we like so much working together we also um did like a more community event which was a a, a market um sold for food market um in berlin which was also a way to give back to the people in in a more again analog way because um i really believe that the the conviviality and also when we're talking about food is very important to also be together um yeah i think that's that's it um for for food culture days um i'm always a bit worried to give too much information uh, and then it's too too packed so i try to 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 focus on some important um some important parts uh, of food culture days um maybe i would like to just finish by saying that as a platform we we are we are here to disseminate and to give visibility to different voices to different realities um and and uh, and this is also a platform that we want to share with uh, with you with the with the practitioners so please connect with us if you feel called by um what i say today and um and also come and visit uh, come and visit us if you are in in, in europe or in switzerland um for the next Biennale, which will happen from the 26th of May to the 4th of June um, in Vevey, and we will make sure to help you to organize your stay and 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 make you part of it. So yeah, this is it. Here, here you go. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, thank you for that. Uh... A uh, very good presentation. Uh, would we request you to just hold on to we have a we have a discussion. Actually, it's the last sort of panel of the three days, and um, we have uh, we hopefully like a rich discussion about everything. So may I invite Asta here and Lauren and Rohan uh, to join us on the stage, and we have now. A, Mark, Margot, and Asta, Lauren, and Rohan. And I'm sure you must have thought of questions by now, because so the floor is open. It's going to click, kick off. Maybe, maybe I should start with Asta <laughs> with some questions I had posed to her. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> would you like to respond to any of those or repeat the questions to respond? Um, no. Uh, so you basically said how how does how do we not make it a uh, best laid plans that go wrong often with working with communities that happens. Right. Um, one of the things is that I focus on location and long term projects. So that it's not situated around a grant. And I actually, this is uh, Rajendra Negi, uh, the area, as I mentioned, is Beat Bachao, so enough and more researchers and journalists and uh, go and take the stories, extract the information and leave never to be seen again. I have met filmmakers who've gone there who never bothered to show the film to Sudesh Naji while the film was made on her. So one thing I was sure of that I would keep going back regularly and on my own cost and money and not make it a grant related issue. Otherwise, there are deadlines and, uh, you know, you trivialize the project and put it into these bite sized three month things. I don't think that worked for me. So that the second is also um, as a woman, I don't have land. I can go anywhere and be anyone's villager. So that kind of liberated me in some way. I know it's it could be read as a very terribly sad thing, but to me, it is quite liberating that I don't actually belong anywhere uh, and so and also it's caste so the village and most of the people I work with are from the same sub caste as mine so when they met me they accepted me as one of their own in 2012 I was invited to be on the board for of the radio station as the only outsider non Uttarakhand uh, artist on their board so. right we come back to you uh, 
uh, Lauren and Rohan. Responses uh, while other people ask questions, responses to what you see here as foraging, foraging practices and local food cultures. Are they the kind of stories you would imagine are addressing the issues you raised? So maybe for us, we would be more interested in conversations, not around soil, but around land. And uh, the reason for that is because when you focus on land, you're forced to confront the history of land. So you're, so you're forced to ask yourself certain questions about who owns the land, who owned the land before this, you know, uh, behind every piece of private property, there's a really violent history, right? And if you, if you uh, focus on soil in a vacuum, then that history is sort of uh, forgotten. So a much more holistic way to think about or to talk about, uh, you know, or to focus on like socioeconomic problems is to focus on the land itself. And indigenous people everywhere, they're not really fighting for soil back. They're fighting for land back. We're fighting for land redistribution because that's where the consolidation happens, right? And uh, the soil is a slightly more, uh, it's a, yeah, it's a slightly more top layer. Uh, it's a more surface level, uh, you know, way to approach the problem. Whereas if you, if you focus on the land itself and the history of the land, then I think it's, uh, much more meaningful conversation because you can focus on the story of the land. So what kind of stories do you focus on? Around land? Yes, because you said you would like telling stories and so we like to hear some of the stories which you think address the kind of politics you are pointing towards. Well, uh, community is fighting for land back, right? These are stories that, uh, why are they fighting for land back? If you uh, look at, say, uh, you know, communities in India, say, like the Naxalbari movement and all of that, why are they, uh, why are they, some of them are violent movements also, but then why, why do they fight? What is the conflict? Where does the conflict lie? The conflict does not lie in soil. It lies in the fact that they, they have been displaced from their lands and they're trying to reclaim these lands, right? So these are the kind of stories we like to center. Stories where justice is, justice and power is at the center of the problem. And yeah, it's, you know, when we focus on the soil itself, we don't, it just looks like a bunch of people fighting over, you know, nonsensical things. But then when we look at the history of the land itself, it uncovers a lot more truth about the, you know, about the culture. So, I mean, that's argumentative what you're saying, but I wonder if anybody in the soil assembly would like to react to that. Provocation. Nobody? You're willing to whimper and hide again and below the bench? No response? No, no, no. Uh, actually, Kerala is... Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, in Kerala is one of the places where we had this land uh, uh, redistribution. Hi, hi. Yeah, we will. Why didn't you come up here? You're completely in the dark. Okay. Uh, Kerala is one of the places where we have had this kind of land distribution, uh, redistribution, uh, because that was a major problem like after after independence. I think uh, uh, Vinoba Bhave tried to do that Bhutan movement and all was also part of that. Uh, There are so many people fighting for uh, land and, and not able to own land. And uh, also the laws in the country also, uh, like you don't feel like something, you don't feel like a citizen in the sense you can't buy land somewhere else. You can't migrate. You can't, uh, there are restrictions. Uh, government has reasons for that. But I mean, people are working through that. Uh, but the, the fight has always been for land. And, and most histories are uh, on 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 land only, so that that is the bigger bigger picture. But now this is a time of crisis where uh, the soil is 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 is, uh, is problematic. So that is why we are discussing more about the soil, and, and we are more interested in in that. 
that that aspect and i don't think it is uh, nonsensical talk it, it is not it is i think the most important talk because people have to eat i mean most people eat three times a day so uh, then uh, how do you uh, preserve the land and and with all this climate change that is happening because of overland use of certain places uh, i mean the soil has to be protected and the soil has been depleted of so many uh, of what it what it has of microbes and all that so uh, so enriching that soil becomes a very important part of uh, part of our existence i think i don't first of all i don't think it's like a binary of one or the other right but i do think that what we have to recognize is that our relationship with the environment is a reflection of our relationship amongst ourselves right and that you want to look at climate change you want to look at soil health right let's look at let's start by looking at soil health the healthiest soils are actually in lands governed by indigenous peoples today that's where the majority of the biodiversity is those are democratic you know decentralized systems of governance of community governance right um the result of that that sustainability is a result of that justice within the social ecosystem right and so i think it's really important to recognize the systems that we're in place with right now for instance climate change is a crisis right but yet 1% of the world contributes over double of the co2 than the bottom 50% right like who do you think controls all the land who do you think is perpetuating these systems it's a class issue and it becomes a deeply class conversation that we need to have as people right and i think that when you look at land and soil through a political lens you're able to uncover that social dimension that can confront the very system rather than just gaslight humanity as a whole right and i think that's what we're trying to get at right like it's not soil is a beautiful thing it takes billions of years to create the billions of you know microorganisms that exist and that hold life as sacred but yet it also sits in isolation as a depoliticized substance in the normative conversation of regenerative agriculture right and regenerative so, agriculture so i just i yeah. understand i mean i'm just curious why do you think people in the room don't understand all what you're pointing towards the politics of land why would you assume that's the case and why would you assume that that soil is a depoliticized subject so that's the question i want you to leave with you right now because i think people in the room do understand what you're saying i'm more curious about the stories you want to tell and i gave you the example of anna singh's story the foraging foraging mushrooms and then the relationship to capital markets which is a new way of telling a story about uh, about land and about land rights uh so there are many ways to tell stories so i'm just not comfortable at assuming that people in the room don't understand those stories i was that's why the question asked what are the stories you want to tell but i'll come back to you oh, yeah. why 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 you i want to now go to two of our guests on the on the screen and uh, I really want somebody in the room to ask them questions, or if they want to say something about what they've been hearing, Margot and Mark. Ah, uh, hello, hello. Am I audible? Can I ask a question to yes, Mark? Yes, please. Ah, uh, okay. So I um genuinely I was really excited when we got the opportunity to make a a microscope with the help of Maya in class. and uh, i wanted to know how does hacketeria as an organization find the perfect recipe to you know give us this information for example uh, with the microscopes um we were given all of these sets of uh, you know tools to kind of build our own so i want to know how does the back end of this work like uh, how does hacketeria come up with finding and curating all of these um you know sources of information that they can pass over is there a team that sits and you know creates this for months or is it just trial and error all the time so i would really i'm really curious to know uh, how 
the back end works um am i audible yes um i i hope i even explained already answered your question in my talk but obviously not Well, there's two backends. One is more, let's say, institutional administratively. This is a bit challenging at the moment, but anyway, um, running a few of these online platforms, it's pretty affordable. It doesn't cost a lot of money. But the the way we we figured out how to develop, let's say, new workshop concepts and new instructions is exactly this, let's say, two weeks hack lab, where we give workshops to each other. We try something out, and nothing works. So we're not in the pressure of the schoolroom already. Yeah? We are like in this play playroom. Sometimes also with the ushers, we we make this metaphor of of like the band room you have with your band, where you jam, where you you know try out some tunes, and in the end you come up with maybe a song, and maybe a few months later you even perform it on stage. So we do these workshop jams at these temporary laboratories that I mentioned. These like two three weeks of intercultural gatherings. Uh, we try out the workshop we have never done before, and then it gets shaped through the interactions from the other peers, and then maybe it's applied at the school, or it's applied at a, an art space, or it's applied with a bunch of hackers. Um, so it's really this having also as a creative having sometimes these playgrounds. I think it's crucial to develop these new um, workshop modules instead of just like sitting ho at home and thinking about something, and you have this deadline in two weeks to perform it. Let's say a more formal institutional environment. I hope that answers your question. Maybe I also say something to the ideas of um, how to develop something, and mainly is like. Open source, which stands behind, so we don't invent stuffs from the new thing. Like we take things that are existing already, ideas like Cedric Carl, who from Atelier Twenty One, who showed us all those brilliant licenses that never had success, and now they become interesting again. So internet is there and has all this information and the research as well. There's a lot of information in the internet, but nowadays we have this problem of fake news. Too much individualism again, like social media, and so what also defines hacktheory is also to work collaboratively, right? So this idea that spending a lot of time together with your friends and thinking of one subjects and try to find solution towards this—it's not an invention from today to tomorrow. It takes time, of course. Yes, yes. So. A question I'd like to ask Margot, please. So uh, I'm really interested in this uh, in Pave, the biennial you propose and you hold actually, and the next one is happening in a few months. Yeah. So what is uh, what do you see happening after after the biennial? What kind of conversations have you seen? Conversations change. Uh, what role does it have in making people more involved or Think, think differently. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for 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 this question and coming back also to 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 the vet, let's say because I also realized that my presentation I I mentioned that it was also like the headquarter of Nestle but for what do we do with that for me for us let's say the most important is to actually propose like an alternative alternative narrative to the one of exploitation and 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 violence and social injustice um even even if it's in a in a in a small scale because um it's true also that like in switzerland through the like the the abundance and the resources some of the topics sometimes can feel very like far away from like I would say us because I don't want to like differentiate myself from the public or anyone. But so it's like, how do we also engage with those topics in uh, a specific context that is so flat, that is quite foreign to to some of the um, of, of the violences that we we discuss also today, also in the presentation of uh, of a growing culture. Um, I like to think about a festival um, or an event as. A, 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 sh a short moment where we can actually 
um, present or, or imagine together what it could be if we could do, if we could imagine something um, more sustainable, fair, ethical. So step by step with food culture days, we tried to do that. Like we tried to um, take care of the, of course, the environmental impact, but also the social impact and also to involve like the public into those questions. Why is it important? Um, why is it important also for you, even though you don't, um, you're not maybe related uh, to the, to this topic? And then I'm coming back to this notion of questioning how do we, how do we relate to each other and how, do, how do we relate to the, to the environment? And I really believe in the power of experiences more than, uh, so much like statistics in a way. Um, um, and, yeah, I think because of the situatedness um, of having Nestlé in the city also, I hope that it can bring attention and that it can open discussion and also um, like just just show that that we we are concerned and we are holding them accountable also in a way. Um, I, yeah, without without being too like also let's say <laughs> let's say um romanticizing that there is a discussion that can happen, but um I think it's it's quite uh, unique and crucial that there is actually a um a, an, an event that is talking about um about social injustice, social inequalities, uh, environment, ecology in the city. So um. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but I think is we we just try to do the best we can with uh, not we with at the same time not trying to 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 repeat like systems of oppression or um, power structure. But it's really hard. Uh, it's it's hard because we're so embedded in it. So I guess it's also an open invitation to engage with us in any way and to to hold also us accountable as a Swiss platform to um to our our intentions yeah what kind of programming accompanies uh, a biennial what kind of programming sorry about programming or activating the biennial during the biennial oh yeah sure so it's a very it's very like broad program we have um around 40 um participants uh, in 2023 um 60 projects uh we Let's say you arrive, you have the, 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 the opening in the central location that is this year half a kitchen, half a gathering space, half a, an exhibition space. But having the kitchen in the public space for us was very important also to reclaim like uh, the, the public space uh, as a space for, um, yeah, again, exchanges, conviviality, um, free speech. <laughs> Um, so this is, uh, this is one of our main projects this year. And then we have a programmation of, um, collective cooks, chef, artists, um, 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 migrants that are invited into this kitchen to take over. There is really carte blanche and they can present during one day, whatever they, they, they want. They can cook food for a lot of people. They can also, it can also be very symbolical. Um, and then there is the more, uh, or let's say, yeah, the more artistic also programmation, which then is um, a program of screening um, around um, this year. We have actually also the, 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 the film of the Mushroom Speaks, but we also have um, a collective called Seasonal Neighbors that uh, addresses question of co co coexistence within the countryside of Europe and notion of um like feeling home and um movement also in relation to uh to seasonal labor um in 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 different uh, parts of europe um then you will have collective meals uh, uh workshops uh, as i say it's quite participatory and um and 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 also um yeah like collaborate collaborative and then this year, also to kind of balance a little bit the, the more collaborative uh, actions, we have um, an, um, an art, like a, yeah, an art exhibition within, um, through, like through the city 
in places like cafe, restaurant, and uh, some small hotels, because we want to reclaim like like those spaces as spaces for exchange of, of knowledge and culture, no? Because um, working in this field since now, like 2017, a lot of also cultural institution or artistic institution are still a little bit reluctant to like fund food, you know? It's like, why is food like culture? And for me, it's still completely nonsense that we we have to we have to um, make a point and we have to prove that what we're doing is culture. So because of that, we decided to exhibit like some some um, some pieces, some projects in those spaces. So in very emblematical, uh, yeah, cafes, old, um, very old. Um, uh, historical restaurants um and 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 yeah and to to make people discover also the variety the diversity of the the local scene and the local gastronomy scene um in the way um because there is not only like the food museum of alimentarium or like the heart quarter of nestle the way is also very vivid and actually very also um involved in uh food food uh food politics like there is also a lot of project with food um like uh agricultures like um it's 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 moving so um, yeah and then like um yeah every kind of a lot of the different um projects um are th thought to 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 engage like to engage with the public and to create um yeah, moment of suspension, let's say, in the in the in the daily life of of the public, and 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 be together. I come back to you about your multicultural background and how that helps in the idea. Yes, I'll come back to you in a moment. But going to Asta, uh, we still have a few minutes, right? Minutes. Yeah. Going to Asta. How would you? You have experience of working in the maybe the beach, Bichau, Andolan and people who are trying to protect the productivity of the land for, for the sake of the land itself, in a sense. How would you, what's been your experience in the Himalayas about relationship between productivity of land, uh, the economies, local economies, and the land itself? Get you another one here. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, they still have uh, good fertile land. They still have seed banks, but uh, that's not the trend anymore. And advertising influences the way we think so much. Uh, not a single child wants to grow up to be a farmer. And uh, so the relationship with the land is kind of fractured. And the people who are now slowly coming, if at all they are, moving from the cities back to now buying land from the farmer so that they can live that life. And it's come a full circle. Um, and I hope that that's not the case. I, I so hope that the, this it, intervention... What is it you're trying to do? You're going to, start, you're going to, going to recreate the local to create an, systems? To create an argument around these notions that we have because of the popular cinema culture that we consume, that this must be done. And that this is the better life. And this idea of better, I think, needs to be subverted and questioned. And with this, the school that we are doing, we do it with the radio station anyway. But it, I think at the, the school, it really comes together uh, with the Rajendar at one level talking about practices uh, that belong to a certain time and era. And me trying to work making their school curriculum more localized, relevant. And hopefully, we'll have uh, at least one or two who'd want to be farmers when they grow up and not just work in the big city because a lot of the people who leave the valley don't uh, a lot of them um work in in hotels etc and live in clustered homes and the life is not very good actually so yeah so how would you see the idea of land productivity and land in in rural india in non urban india where uh, people are not able to inhabit the land because of productivity issues. So if you're very small land holding, like a one acre or two acre land holding, you cannot produce enough food there to be able to survive and make the product productive. So how will you differentiate the idea of land? And associated with that is the question of who owns the land within the family structure as well. 
So is it what's the gender relationship of plant in terms of legal laws and etc.? So how would you then separate the idea of productivity from the idea of land itself? Because you talked of food and agriculture, and then you say soil is not important. So I want you to talk about that. Um, I think soil is very important. I don't think that's what he meant, or though. So I, I do think soil health is is an incredibly important aspect of productivity. I think the challenge becomes productivity in the angle of what productivity for who, right? And I think what we've seen in many systems, especially in India, is one hectare of land can produce an incredible amount of food if that is a monoculture and it's designed for the market, it doesn't, it might not produce enough compensation for that farmer to be a net for food purchaser to go to the, be able to buy at the store. But if that farmer was producing for themselves and their community in a diverse way, that would actually be extremely productive. And this is where like the power of language comes in again, which I think was at the heart of that misunderstanding before, right? Where how we center these words, like, in a grown culture, we use the word peasant versus farmer, right? And we use that mostly intentionally. And a lot of people ask us, why do you use that word, right? And that's because the word peasant means to live with and off the land. It's having control over that production system. The word farmer comes from French Latin ferme, which is to rent and to lease. And it's actually like a feudal relationship with a dominant land system or a market, right? and the empire or the state and so the peasantization of agriculture where communities were in charge of what they were growing and feeding for themselves was actually a threat to a lot of the state and so they pushed against that and pushed people into monoculture models and so those are the models that haven't been productive for farmers they might have been productive for the corporations so i'm saying that what about models which are trying to recover productivity of land in a biodiverse way as a way of keeping people on the land absolutely in an economic way not have farmer suicides but actually occupy the land not because somebody's taken it taken it away from them because it's just not productive enough to stay there so how would you then differentiate productivity of land and i'm not saying it has to be monoculture or or uh, genetically modified and market oriented only but markets can also shift for example, the current shift towards millets from wheat uh, and rice is a, is a recent shift. So markets also shift in terms of uh, what kind of seeds are grown there. So I'm just sort of questioning your premise that soil is apolitical, land is political, and the two are separate. Le Bruno Latour calls soil the 20 centimeters of the critical zone, So and there's a reason why he does that. But I'm just sort of wondering about your declaration that this is a political and nonsense. So that's the word you use. So I sort of need to react to that. Actually, Marx talks about uh, yeah. <laughs> the metabolic rift. Yeah. Where uh, in a capital society, land gets so used up and degraded that there will be this metabolic rift. I, I don't know who can become more political than Marx. Karl Marx, I'm talking about. Yeah. No, so it's, it's about has, the soil. The soil degradation. So I like to clarify. Okay. What, what I called nonsensical was in relation to the Naxalbari movement, which I made in reference to. You know, how if you see that conflict in isolation in with just the soil alone, it sounds like a nonsensical conflict because you cannot make sense of why the conflict is there in the first place. Right? That's the context in which I said nonsensical. And the only way you can make sense and understand where the community is coming from is, is if you look at the history of the land. The soil being apolitical is a different point. But then like that's where the nonsensical bit came. And I realize that that's probably like been taken out of context no, but the soil the soil bit i'll tell you why 
uh, I have a contention with soil in the first place and why I have a contention with the way in which it is used right now. It's not soil that's inherently wrong. Soil is, uh, has no fault of its own that it deserves, you know, like me calling it apolitical. It's because of the co-option of soil by many popular movements that it is simply not sufficient to have a proper conversation about soil like health which anymore. movements are you referring to? I'm safe soil. Sadhguru. No, yeah. we're not discussing Sadhguru. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sadhguru no, doesn't no, 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 saying, I'm saying that a serious movement. I'm saying that. Sadhguru is that, not a movement. He's I'm a religious saying, figure. So, so you can tell me which, safe soil, is, safe soil is very much a movement so now. If you can tell me which movement has appropriated soils and make it apolitical, I'll be happy to hear that. A, a, a people's movement no. around the world, including in Latin America. I'll be, I'll be pleased to hear that. Because I, I think we are not... I think... It's trivializing the question of soil. That, that's the reason I'm objecting to what you're saying. And I want you to defend it. I'm giving a chance yeah, to defend okay. it. No, no. Act, actually, uh, how, how, what about e e eco-socialism? Okay. The metabolic rift and the eco-socialism. How, how informed are you about that? What, what are you and what is your idea about naxalism in, yeah. in, in India? How old are you? How old am I? How is it relevant? We have come through this naxal movement. Yeah? We have seen it around. We have grown with it. Okay. So don't talk about uh, the Naxal movement like that. Don't trivialize it. How is talking about the history and asking no, you to look a, beyond the soil no, itself? I'm sorry. To we have, we're not discussing because it's a very complex movement. So it's not to do with only land. So it's a complex movement. It's centered around the uh, idea of land rights, but it's complex in the political environment it was. And uh, to, so when you when you evoke that, then he has a right to discuss that with you, right? That's what I'm saying. So, we can discuss it. Yeah. I'm open to discussing it, but then, like, how okay, does my so, age have anything? So, to no, so it actually so it sort of goes beyond the remit of this. Sorry about this that. discussion. Um, before I wrap up, uh, I'd like to do two things. Firstly, is invite everybody who's still there to say the last few words, and starting with. Margot, if you want to say that, and I ask you this question about your cultural diversity in in a in increasingly diverse Switzerland, from what I've seen, <laughs> and how does that help in terms of food as culture idea, or anything else you might want to end with? So maybe no, maybe I because it's also a big uh, a big topic. So maybe I I I, I wrap up, but by, by just saying that all of the the work that. I've seen like today, um, and, and are immensely inspiring to me. And maybe because the talk was also about community, um, that I'm very, um, grateful to be challenged like every day by other practitioners, um, work. Um, because I've been following also a growing culture, like uh, a lot, like in the, in the recent years, I, I'm very just happy to say thank you. And also to you guys, to the soil assembly, that is, has been, yeah, super, super nice to just follow your step and everything was incredibly well organized. So thank you so much for bringing us together uh, today. Thank you, Margot. Thank you for joining us from Bebe. And is Mark still there? Or has he, has he thought it's been a long time? Maybe he's not there anymore. Okay. Well, if he comes back then. So, Ma Asta? Um, I think this question came up in the morning to ask uh, Suresh how an artist and a farmer and that that question. I just I was thinking about and I feel that uh, the Kalakar is very different from the artist. And to be the Kalakar is a different trope within the Indian scenario. We still imagine the Kalakar as someone who hangs a harmonium around the neck and goes village to village. Somebody who has no real agenda, which was kind of nice. So it's nice to be a Kalakar in India. I'm not an artist. <laughs> Thank you. I was so inspired by what you said, especially I loved when you talked about how artists break rules. <laughs> that was inspiring. Um, Thank you for inviting us to this place. It's uh, my fifth time in India, first time in Kochi. It's a beautiful place and I just want to take that moment to share gratitude for for being here um 
and being on this talk. I think Mark came back now, so I also yes. want to make sure he gets a chance. Sure. Um, but thank you, everyone, and really look forward to tapping into the world's most renewable resource, which is collaboration. Wonderful. We are glad to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, and after uh, we give him a, you, you want to say a few words before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, I'd like to first apologize. No, for, no, no please. Uh, arguments, I don't know what happened. It's a part of democratic thinking <laughs> yeah. and, and, and moving ahead. So, and, so uh, please don't apologize. Yeah, it I, wasn't I meant think... to put you in a spot. But sure, sure. good discussions need good arguments, both sides. <laughs> I <believe> so, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, thank you for like inviting us into this space. I guess it's kind of an alien space for us also because uh, it, yeah, interacting with uh, the art community and how it interacts with uh, food. And it's pretty interesting to see all the intersections. And uh, I didn't realize that the space was so broad. And yeah, I, it's actually more that. than just the arts community. It's an academic community, a political community, a practitioner's community. And actually, the best collaborations are between people who challenge each other. So thank you for coming. Mark, your last words, please. For this yeah, session. Enjoy. Enjoy your time together. Thank you. I'm sad I'm not there. Thank Bye. You. Bye. -bye. And now uh, I'll hand it to uh, the second thing was handed to Mina to present whatever, how this you want to close the ceremony and close the event, etc. And for the next two days. Thank you. Hello, the event's still not over. We still have two more days to go. And uh, both the days we are going to have film screenings now by people who made uh, the films. Is Vasanti here? Vasanti, can you come up and talk about the films tomorrow and day after? So Vasanti, Dr. Vasanti das, das has curated the films. So Vasanti, if you can just come and say a few words about the films from tom for tomorrow and day after. Oh, you are here. I'm looking at the light. Please come a little. Please come a little early than the six o'clock because Neil is leaving day after. So uh, the official closing, which we were planning to do day after, might we will do some bits tomorrow and then the day after. Good evening, and uh, I. It's not just me curating. Even I also participated in it. I mean, maybe he got dragged into it. So uh, the films put together are by both of us. And uh, for my part, I, I, I kind of also maybe misunderstood, misunderstood but maybe not. Um, so instead of taking it as soil, I was looking at critical zone. Um, and in that composition, it is also connected with Gaia and also critical zone in terms of soil, water, and all the material around it, etc. air as well, and so on. So I thought of making an assemblage of all these different uh, things. I, but uh, I don't, I did not end up because I didn't get some of the films that I wanted. Uh, but I'm, we are screening Ursula Beeman's work, uh, a Swiss filmmaker, and uh, we will also be screening uh, Sohil Vaidya, uh, an Indian filmmaker, and um, that will be Murmurs of the Jungle, and uh, Ursula Beeman is about water, and um, uh, Ewan and um, Ewan's films also are here, with, along with the, um, yeah, so anyway, the, the film is uh, about uh, mushrooms, uh, not mushrooms, it is about uh, fungi, and uh, the other one is, uh, I mean, uh, finally, on the last day, we will be screening mushrooms uh, or the mushroom speaks. So we are just uh, giving some voice to different kind of aspects of the soil and related to soil. I don't want to kind of talk 
too much about it now because tomorrow when we are going to screen it would be much better so yeah that's what i would like to say but they are uh, beautiful films and i mean to say i don't like to call beautiful films because aesthetics is important but rather because um in ursula's case definitely she tries to kind of uh, uh, see make us see finally how beautiful the earth is and what are we doing to it and uh, she kind of has a visual sample of water like just like the critical zone scientists collect water samples soil samples and take it to the laboratory she is bringing visual samples of water from arctic to the uh, south american countries so that's my Thank you and good night. Evan wants to say something. I suggest we, we do a collective photo on stage. Everybody on stage, take a group photo of the assembly. Yes, yes please, everybody come. Yeah, <laughs> 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 